the investigation was there in fact uh, that how many patents are filed on that crop can you imagine more than 20000 patents are filed on this single crop more than 20000 patents are filed on this single crop and when they did the further investigation they found that procter and gamble followed by the colgate palmolive they have filed the maximum patents and that is the reason that in today's uh, time in unja mandi of um, uh, you know gujarat which is the largest mandi for this uh, psyllium crop the rates are decided by these two com companies procter and gamble and colgate palm olive so this is the power of research this is the power of ip and first step we have to see that whatever we are doing it should reach to the masses and that can be reached to the masses when we'll put a good science in those sort of commerce you know the grassroots innovations or traditional knowledge practices so let me move uh, you know ahead and give some uh, brief about uh, the national innovation foundation uh, though my colleague has already explained that it is an autonomous body or department of science and technology but what it works in fact and i have a complete value chain it is start from scouting the innovation it add value uh, to the people's knowledge it protect ip in the name of the people do the dissemination through social and commercial way until today we have developed the biggest database of uh, the grassroots innovations and outstanding traditional knowledge in 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 an app which is more than 3 lakh out of it uh, over 1 lakh 15000 innovations we made it open source because there has to be a fate of every technology if somebody is submitting the technology to an app either we will do research on that or we'll make it open source so it net a portal of uh, uh, open source technologies are also there in fact which ai city later has uh, circulated to all the colleges so that more and more students could do research on that uh, uh, you know on on, on those uh, sort of uh, knowledge or on those sort of uh, grassroots innovations because when you are talking in thousands or you know lakhs uh, it is not uh, possible by one institution to do the research on everything. In fact, you need large number of people like the pool of students. Uh, somebody they, they are doing dissertation in their PG or UG programs. Definitely, they need the right programs, and this portal can give the right problem. In fact, if you if you want to go innovation.nif.org.in, please note down. I'll also share my PPT to with 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 you. So you can also find out the solution of many problems which you can include in your, uh, you know, the PG program or, you know, in the, your digitization program and can be the result of many good technologies. So what sort of those innovations are there? These innovations are related to engineering, the related to agriculture, the related to human health and the related to veterinary. So in every area, in fact, last three might be useful for you people, in fact, as you are from biotechnology area. And I have seen, in fact, some students are there from agriculture background also. So in agriculture, there might be lots of uh, the, the new plant varieties. There might be many practices which can be useful for the control of insect pest and many agriculture agronomic practices. In human health, lots of traditional knowledge kind of thing in fact and similarly in uh, you know veterinary now let me move to my topic which was validation value addition and product development see many times we get the information from the people and we put our scientific mind in that actually and many times we go far from the information which is provided by the healer so this is not this is not correct many time the in your in many traditional knowledge you must have seen that somebody is saying that you make uh, you know the blend of these two three plants 
take it with oil, take it with butter, take it with this. Those carriers also play an important role. But when we start the experimentation, first thing, first mistake what we used to do, in fact, we first do the extraction in chloroform. We do the, you know, in acetone, in, uh, you know, ethanol, in hexane, you know, the, the solvents of different polarities. Why you want to go to the solvent? Why not the water? Because in many cases, these herbal healers are using it with water. Then why are you going to the non-polar kind of things, in fact? So listen it care very carefully. When we had the collaboration with the Indian Council of Medical Research, so first few years we have spent on you know, developing the protocols only. Because when we have given projects to different scientists, what they did, they did experimentation as per their way. And when the committee have seen, in fact, they found that, oh no, it's not correct actually. You have to change your protocol. So we thought that if the protocols are not there, let us first uh, uh, you know, develop the protocol. And that was the important thing that came out from the deliberation that the first experimentation has to be there as per the information provided by the herbal healer. Look at carefully what herbal healer is saying. Uh, let me give one example. In fact, uh, we got some information from uh, you know the Jharkhand. Uh, one herbal healer has used a plant for the treatment of typhoid, and we sent it for testing to ICMR virus unit in Kolkata and NICET Kolkata. So both the institutions were working on that, and. Uh, we were getting that the healer is quite good and um, he has treated large number of people. But when the result came from the lab, it was not working. It was not working and we were not convinced because we have seen uh, that the, the healer is treating to the people, but why not scientifically we are getting the same result. <clears throat> so there was a brainstorming. And uh, that time we asked the scientist to visit the herbal healer's place. Just see that where we are committing the mistake and we identified that we are just getting the leaves and doing the experimentation as per the scientific protocols. But herbal healer said very clearly that only tender leaves are useful. You see different phenolic stage of the plants are also equally important. So he was using tender leaves and we were taking, you know, every type of leaf and, and old leaves, you know, that was the difference. So when you're working on traditional knowledge practices, be careful. First, you have to listen to the healer. You have to listen to the practitioner and see that how he's using it. The first experimentation has to be according to that. When the scientist has taken the tender leaves, then he found very good results. Rather, they were so excited that because in NYSAT there is a hospital, they have isolated the stains, uh, the pathogen from the patients, uh, and those patients, pa those uh, you know, stains, those pathogens which were resistant to the modern antibiotics. Even this formulation was effective against those. Uh, resistant antibiotics also, you know, resistant stains also. So with the discussion, we found that there was a gap. So we have to see, fill that gap in fact. Second thing, when we are going for the validation of any technology, we want to do everything in fact. We are the expert in, you know, extraction. We are the expert in purification. We are the ex experts in, microbiology in you know preclinical kind of trials and if given opportunity then we can do the clinical trial it is not right we might be the expert of one domain so when we were moving toward the product development or taking a technology to the market we have to identify the right partners also because everyone is having the right expertise and as per their expertise, we have to make a group and then we have to move ahead and then only we may achieve the 
we may achieve the success. So this is the first step of validation. Now you must be thinking that uh, or you are talking about traditional knowledge, but traditional knowledge, what we will do with the traditional knowledge? Can we file the patent? Because as per the act, the traditional knowledge is not patentable. I'm not just talking about the traditional knowledge. I'm talking about the innovations in them. You know, many times, because NIF is not National Institute of Traditional Knowledge, we are the National Innovation Foundation, and we see the, uh, we work on the innovativeness of any technology. So we decided after certain deliberation that we will work only on new plants not mentioned in classical codified system. Classical codified system is your Ayush system, Ayurveda, Yunani, Yoga, Siddha, Homeopathy. That is a classical uh, traditional knowledge system. We will not work on any technology or any plants which is mentioned in classical codified system. Definitely it is an innovation. If we will use, then there has to be a new use found on the plant mentioned in the class. We may work on the, the, the same plant but not for the same use. Or we may work if it is in a combination, you know, something at least, at least one constituent of the formulation is satisfying about these two criteria. Then only we would be able to work. So here we are seeing the novelty, novelty in the technology, the innovative step in the technology, an innovative step cannot be only the the uh, material it can be material it can be in method it can be in use you know many times you see that uh, that aspirin aspirin is uh, used for anti-inflammatory property but there is a new use of aspirin that it is a good blood thin thinner and many times the doctors are also giving ex aspirin, uh, aspirin for um, uh, your uh, heart patients because it is a it is a good uh, uh, you know blood thinner it is a good blood blood thinner so that is a new use of the same plant uh, sorry of a same same medicine you know so then uh, the novelty can be there in material the novelty can be there in method and the novelty can be there in in use so we have to establish that novelty. So in NIF, we are working on many issues. In fact, uh, we have a task force uh, with the Indian Council of Medical Research, and we identified certain areas, uh, you know, on which we will work based on the priority and limited resources we do have, because um, the research is very expensive. When you move ahead, in fact, and you are developing, uh, you know, a product, then lots of trials you have to conduct. So keeping that in view, we thought that let us work on the common and most important, uh, uh, you know, elements of the uh, country. And then we started working. We identified pain and inflammation, joint health, diabetes, metabolic disorders, bone health, like the osteoporosis. <coughs> cancer, dermatology, tuberculosis, epilepsy, oral care, wellness, vital organ like liver, kidney, stress management, we work on nutraceutical and uh, cognition and brain. You know, till today, many success stories are there. Why those success stories are there, in fact, at least at this time, seven technologies of NIF are there in clinical trial phase, maximum, you know, if you see any institute in the country, and approximately 10 technologies are ready to go to the clinical trial phase, you know, and it happened because we move very systematically. We first establish the novelty, we file the patent in the name of uh, the innovator, and then we have involved the right kind of partner. Every time we have not tried to do every experiment. Rather, we our strength is involving the right partner at the right stage. <coughs> and those partners can be from private sector. Those partners can be from the 
public sector. So we are taking the help of Dabur, Anthem, Jubilee and Part, many institutions in fact, which are not there in public uh, you know, sector. Likewise in, in veterinary science, veterinary also you cannot ignore. It is easy to, to take veterinary medicines to the market uh, and we identified mastitis, uh, infertility, retention of placenta, bloat, uh, milk enhancer, tick infestation, endoparasite, ephemeral fever, and poultry kind of, uh, you know, the problems, which are the problems, in fact, the whole nation is uh, facing at that time. And there is a gap. Here there is a gap and the people need the cost effective uh, uh, medicines uh, in these areas also. You see some other medicines which are already there in the market. Mastoic is doing good. In fact, uh, rather uh, it has been taken by the government in malaria eradication program. And this product is uh, uh, working working very good. In fact, in eastern part of the eastern part of the country, these are some of the product uh, you know based on the traditional knowledge uh, which are there in the market. Because I was asked to focus not only on validation and value addition, I was asked to focus on commercialization of technologies. So these are the technologies which are there based on the herbal healers uh, knowledge and these technologies are now there in the market. They are doing good. People, doctors are recommending and finally the herbal healers are getting royalty on the commercialization of these technologies. It is a very good gel in fact. Uh, this is liposomal in the uh, nature it is absorbed by the tissues, in fact. So the residues are not coming to the milk. Mastitis is a problem of udder, the infection in the udder. And the, it is a very painful condition, in fact. And sometimes the blood comes or the pus cells comes in the, in, the, in the milk. But this formulation is so good, in fact. It is very well acceptable. And it is based on the traditional knowledge. So now you see the journey. Sometimes some person is saying that, okay, I use these plants. In fact, I was washing the udder and, uh, uh, you know, boiling the le leaves in the oil and uh, was using those medicated oil. But neither that decoction you can sell in the market, nor those medicated oils you can sell in the market. You have to have a good product. So our aim is to put high science in traditional knowledge practices so that the products could be de developed and those products tomorrow go to the people back and the knowledge holders could get uh, the money out of the commercialization of these technologies. We have, we worked on, you know, uh, one of the formulations, uh, formulation for um, COVID-19. And here what we did in fact, because you must be thinking that uh, COVID is, came in 2020. It cannot be a traditional knowledge practices to cure this. Uh, definitely it cannot be there. So here what we did in fact, and we, you people, you scientists can do, we did the in silico kind of studies. We try to find out in fact, uh, which herb, herb is uh, effective on which parameter and uh, those in silico, you know, kind of studies when we conducted, we found that there are certain, uh, you know, uh, plants which might be effective uh, for this sort of virus, viral disease. Then we sent it for uh, validation, uh, you know, preclinical trials at, uh, at Dabar. And out of these three formulation, in fact, we found one very effective. Then further we moved to Dr. Bramprakas, uh, Chaudhary Bramprakas uh, Ayurvedic Sansthan in Delhi because they had the facility to uh, do the clinical trials as they were the hospital for the COVID. We have, uh, you know, collaborated with IUS, IUS ministry, and uh, finally the product is developed. Now, Bajnath Pharmaceutical decided to take it to the market. We already signed the MOU and uh, 
I'm hoping that very soon this technology will be there in the market. And this would be a very good technology as on as on now, uh, you know, the maximum uh, patients uh, on which the clinical trials were conducted got cured. They were mild to mod moderate patient. And at this time, the corona has become mild to moderate only. So this formulation will work and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that lots of good uh, royalty will come out of the commercialization. And more than that, uh, uh, lots of people will get rid of, uh, uh, you know, this uh, corona problem with the use of this uh, formulation. So our aim is not to earn much money. Our aim is to help to the people. <coughs> In certain cases, uh, when I said that we work on those technologies which are not there in classic, classical codified text. So then it is difficult to take it to the market because you cannot claim that it is a Ayurvedic formulation. You have to find a regulatory way also. Then we have worked with Ministry of IOS and we are in process to develop the monographs. Monographs of those plants on which we have already worked and after developing the monographs, they can be included in these classical codified texts so that we could get a clear way for the commercialization of our for the commercialization of our technologies. So this is this is a necessary thing. Um, now let me share that many technology which we are developing are not just uh, for commercialization. We want to generate the employment for people. We want to uh, socially disseminate them. And this is one example. Out of many examples, this is one example. You know, we when we shifted in Gandhinagar, in Gram Bharti, we thought that let us interact with different, uh, with different villages near uh, us. And we thought that we, we had a veterinary doctor, in fact, and some other members in his team so they have gone to the places and they found that ticks and lice are the biggest problem in fact in this area so we identified few formulations and conducted experiments on farmers field and we found that a formulation was very useful for ectoparasites ectoparasites in fact that the small small ticks on the uh, you know body of uh, the bovine the buffaloes and um, um, cow. So we started conducting the experiment, in fact, and that formulation has become so popular that ICR has including that formulation in its uh, dissemination agenda. So this uh, now few, if not few lakh, 70, 80,000 families are using it. So what it did, in fact, it has, and, and in this case, we have not told people that you take this technology, you know, in the form of product. We just have given training to them. You make yourself, use yourself, okay? Do it yourself. Why to sell to the product? If some, you know, rural young people want to do the business of it, we will give this technology free of course to them. So this technology is basically, the eradication of this problem and also generate employment in the rural areas. Now, ICR, many institutions of ICR, in addition to the dairy system, like it is NDRI, like it is different veterinary institutions, they did the experiment of this uh, technology. And I'm finding that I, I, I'm found, I have found that uh, in many institutions, this technology they have included in their dissemination program. See, it is not my knowledge, it is the knowledge of people. But if the knowledge of the people are giving relief to other people, you know, nothing like that. If it is generating employment for the rural youth, nothing like, like that. So only thing, it need a platform. It need a platform, not only NIF, but any institutions. So many of you may contribute to the society by taking such sort of knowledge from our database and after doing certain experimentation, you can make them open source. What you will get, you will get the blessings of the people, 
okay so it is not always to take every technology to the market and earn money you can also earn the blessings also so now you know let me move on you know uh, what is the scenario of um, the startup movement you must have heard about the startup companies in fact you must have heard in fact and you will hear uh, you know in this course that people will again and again you know motivate you toward the entrepreneurship you know as on today you know how many startup companies are there approximately 60 65000 startup companies are there and many of them have become the unicorn they were the humble company unicorn is one company in fact which have uh, the evaluation of more than 1 billion dollar you know so more than you know at this time around 83 unicorns are there they started with this case you know the youngsters the students have started them and 83 unicorns are there in fact out of that 75 unicorns have issued the ipos you know and from april to you know november in just in one year 89066 crore were raised via 75 ipos issued you know by these these startup companies in 21 itself there are total 83 unicorns but in 21 itself you know the 44 companies have reached to the uniform unicorn club so now this uh, you know the startup movement is taking taking pace uh, and uh, uh, lots of outcome we are expecting and lots of contribution in the gdp also we are expecting from these unicorns many uh, you know at this time if you see that 46 46% of uh, total number of uh, startup companies are having at least one woman director where these companies are there are they in metro are they in uh, you know small areas at this time if you'll see that uh, in 555 district at least one uh, you know startup company are there at least one you know <coughs> so the reach is everywhere the it is not that startups are there in delhi or in bangalore you know or in mumbai or in ahmedabad definitely more startups will be there in the metros because of the environment but max at least in the in the distant areas in fact and the startups are there in all uh, you know poor districts in fact um, uh, you know the backward districts so at this time what are the challenges of these startups in fact uh, the challenges of you know as per nsic survey in fact the biggest challenge is liquidity 55% startups are facing this problem fresh orders they are not receiving because of this turbulence of covid labor issue is also there but even though even though many of them are doing good business in fact apart from this turbulence uh, i would say that uh, to grow for the growth of any country in fact if you really want to uh, enhance the startup culture or the entrepreneurship promotion then government has to be the buyer and government has decided to buy the direct product tech from these startup companies and government is now doing the purchase through jam like you do on amazon or flipkart or other you know um, uh, portals so jam is a portal developed for the government institutions the departments the ministries its name is government e marketplace like and on that there are certain companies in fact they do the due diligence before putting those companies there and 11386 startup companies are also registered on jam so they can be the direct seller to the government and these 11000 entities have 
डन द सेल ऑफ मोर देन फोर थाउजेंड करोड़ टूडे फोर थाउजेंड करोड़ दीज स्टार्टअप सोल्ड टू द गवर्नमेंट इंस्टीट्यूशन गवर्नमेंट मिनिस्ट्रीज एंड द गवर्नमेंट डिपार्टमेंट इंक्लूडिंग द स्टेट गवर्नमेंट and this number will increase in years to come so this is a good sign in fact uh, you know you are selling directly to the uh, to the government and government is your direct buyer this scenario has changed very fast five years back in fact in 2016 and uh, this was the scenario on my left hand side you are seeing in fact the india was uh, was like this only few startups few startups you are seeing in fact some yellow dots and in 2021 22 the country has become the yellow in fact so this uh, is uh, this i am showing so that you could see that opportunities are everywhere there is no a particular sector there is no particular uh, you know city where these startups are there these startups are are now everywhere actually and they have generated in last 4 uh, uh, years 5,98,3,028 job they have generated so what i said in the beginning that uh, don't be the job seeker be the job provider 5 lakh nine approximately 6 lakh job in last 4 uh, year these startups have have developed definitely it is an achievement so the culture is good in fact at this time uh, you know many people will show this slide and they will say that uh, in innovation index we are around golden boy kotha uh, can you put off your mic uh, who are not students here? please uh, mute your mics okay so people will show this slide to you in fact this is a good in fact uh, in 2015 we were at uh, 81 position of global innovation in global innovation index but now in 21 we are at 45th position and every year our condition is uh, is improving but you see in fact we did the further analysis of this uh, uh, you know thing where we are doing good and where we need to do good you know if you see in market sophistication and technology and knowledge output we are among the top 3 30 countries you know in business sophistication in human capital and research and in institutions we are between 50 to 62 ranks but the creative output and the infrastructure we are lagging behind and we have to put more emphasis on that infrastructure obviously the government uh, has to play important role in that but the creative output like this kind of programs are very necessary in fact to enhance the ranking in creative output it is not uh, that whatever you will get from your teachers you will do the research on that no just think what our society need what our country need what our uh, you know we ourselves need in fact so lots of creativity has to be there behind our work in fact then only we would be able to enhance our our ranking in this in this so let me come to my uh, um institution again in fact we have uh, uh, a technology business incubator under which we are supporting the the grassroots innovators in fact if they want to be the entrepreneur and at this time 22 grassroots innovation based companies are there in fact which have got the tag of a startup companies uh, and uh, around 101 are there in uh, you know in total in fact which we we we, we sel selected actually apart from this startup in fact uh, uh, let me share few slides in fact of nif uh, where you will see that uh, we are also recognizing the the grassroots innovators so we organize a biennial competition in which uh, the president of india give award to the to the the grassroots people you see in fact receiving award by the hand of uh, uh, president of india is always a honor we are scientists we are also happy when we receive award by the prime minister or the president why not these people if you say that knowledge is the economy 
then it is not important that whether the knowledge is coming from the formal sector or the knowledge is coming from the informal sector. Informal knowledge is also equally important and there can be many cutting edge technology tomorrow, uh, you know, which can come from the knowledge of these people. Only a blending with formal science is required. So RF encourage them, in fact, we do lots of other program, in fact, in which uh, these grassroots people or as the school students interact with the, the top leadership of the country. We organize festival of innovation in which president of India, you know, uh, interact with uh, <coughs> the innovators. You're seeing some pics here, in fact, uh, uh, we organize innovation scholar in residence program in which the students from the formal sector or from the informal sector, they are the guest of honorable president of India. They attend the festival of innovation and entrepreneurship. And in addition to that, few days they live in the Rashtrapati Bhavan also. This is another owner, in fact. And the purpose behind this program was to give a message that this country not only cares the innovation, but the country cares the innovators also. You see that some young students, in fact, they are from uh, you know the, the, the primary schools, they are from secondary schools, some grassroots people, in fact, and some of the professionals, in fact, the students like you, the college students, they were the guest of the president of India under this innovation scholar in residence, in residence program. Likewise, in fact, continuously when you are moving ahead, you have to do the brainstorming and this festival, there are lots of brainstorming, there are lots of, um, uh, you know, round tables, round table discussion, so that we could be able to refine our activities in future. So, and, you know, many times you talk about the inclusivity, many times you say that, oh, it's, it's, it should be an inclusive technology. Inclusive, inclusive for whom? It, the technology should not be there for one sector only. Technology has to be there for everyone, in fact. And NF tried to reach everywhere. These are the, you know, pics of some correctional homes, the jail, the jails, the prisoners living there, you know, they also generate employment, you know, they also support their families. Somewhere somebody has to give technology to them also. So it is not there that you will always transfer your technology to the big companies. Many technology has to be there for the self-help group. Many technology has to be there for the rural youth. Many technology has to be there for those, in fact, who need the technologies, who, you know, for inclusivity, you need to, uh, you know, put focus, certain attention on them. And these, uh, these people are, you know, among, among them. So this is the big example of inclusivity, inclusive development. So, <clears throat> you know, the things cannot be in silo. It is not that we are doing this and you are doing something, you know, every player has to do the networking with them. So likewise, we signed the MOU with the Amazon. You all are aware about Amazon, in fact, what it is there, in fact, the biggest portal, uh, you know, for the sale of these technologies and uh, any technology, in fact, now everybody want to be there. So what arrangement we did with Amazon, Amazon will not only give a special space to our innovators, but they will also strengthen the capacity of the innovators because our people are from grassroots. And if you, some of you want to, and periodically, we are, uh, you know, enhancing the capabilities of uh, these, these people. And for that, Amazon is helping us, in fact, uh, in online selling of, of these technologies. So this collaboration might be very useful, in fact, in terms of taking this technology, giving more choice to the consumers, capacity building of these people, and also, like you know that Amazon Prime, you know, lots of stories. So we are planning that uh, a series of innovative, you know, stories has to be there on innovate Amazon Prime. So for that, this uh, the collaboration is there and similar co collaboration very soon we are going to do with Flipkart also, the Walmart Flipkart. And uh, the aim is uh, to 
bring the culture of innovativeness in the country to include everyone in fact you know only one thing only if you you are saying that um, one institution one individual will do everything it's not possible in my slide i have shown that uh, we are taking the help of uh, everyone we are taking the help of scientists for validation of their tech, uh, of technologies for valid value addition for product development we are taking the help of entrepreneurs for taking them to the market we are taking the help of patent attorneys you know how many patents we have filed to, till today 1240 sorry 1256 patents last year itself 62 patents were granted to in one year's time so if a one institution you know if, if you see one institution probably the nif is filing the maximum patents in the country and maximum patents are granting to us so last year 62 patents were granted you know there are 52 weeks and 62 so every week more than one patent was granted to us actually and this year we are hoping that this figure will be somewhere 80 you know 75 to 80 so uh, um, because every week one or two patents are granted and we are filing approximately 100 150 uh, patents in the name of innovators and this could have been possible <coughs> you know because of the networking we have a small team in fact it is not possible by our team to file such you know a large number of patents so we are coordinating we are collaborating with them and they are helping us in the filing of uh, of patents we are taking help uh, in fact uh, in social dissemination large number of ngos large number of institutions in fact are helping us in social dissemination of uh, these technologies generating employment so uh, i was asked to give 10 minutes for question an hour so i'll end my presentation here thank you very much for listening to me thank you doctor Students, you may ask questions or queries, doubts, anything if you have. Anyone having any queries? If there is no query, then either you got everything or you have not got anything. <laughs> But anyway, anyway, since they are the graduation students, yeah. so what I'll do, in fact, I'll share my presentation, in fact, and you can share it with them. Sure, doc. sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Doc. And if, you, if you do have any other query, uh, you know, you can send the mail also to us. Okay, I will get from the students and I'll pass it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, doc. Thank you for your wonderful time, giving us a wonderful speech. Thank you. Uh, hello, Thank sir. You. sir. Yeah. Uh, this is Saurabh. Uh, I had a doubt that uh, uh, as uh, you shown in the presentation, uh, whether NIF only uh, responds to medicine and uh, agriculture related fields or other aspects of engineering also and uh, get in connect with mentors or the process of the NIF. Uh, see, uh, since it was the uh, you know the program of biotechnology, so I kept uh, only the traditional knowledge, veterinary and agriculture kind of things in my presentation. But the maximum success and I have got in, in engineering. <coughs> Our strong domain is agriculture engineering and <coughs> sorry, maximum technologies are there from engineering field. Uh, recently, we have transferred one technology to John Deere. You know, can you imagine that that was the first technology which John Deere has taken out from outside their, uh, you know, R&D. They do not have the policy to take anybody's technology. But we have sold a pellet transplanter to them, actually. Um, so, NF's engine domain is quite, uh, you know, powerful. And uh, we did maximum work in engineering. Maximum patents are also filed in engineering. Since this uh, lecture was related to biotechnology, so I kept this, uh, uh, you know, biotechnology related innovations in, in my presentation. We are working in that. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So, and how to approach the NF? Is there in a pathway or 
or something like that you can write a mail to an info at nifindia.org one more thing i would like to mention here in fact and i have started a biggest program for school students it's inspire awards manak in which uh, it is i'm saying biggest program biggest in the country but biggest in the world can you imagine that uh, we are getting one 10 lakh ideas from the school students from throughout country and we have the provision to support 1 lakh ideas by paying them 1 lakh uh, 10000 each so nobody has started in fact and that 10000 into 1 lakh is 100 crore so we just give 100 crore to the to the students so that they could make the models they could make the proof of concepts and can, can present at district level then they go at state level and finally we give support of 50000 each to one uh, you know 1 lakh 1 lakh students and 60 finally are taken for um, the complete incubation and those student go to japan those student go to asian brics countries also they compete with the students of other so it's it's not just uh, supporting to the student it is also giving them the exposure also and at least 60 students every year could be in the final incubation program and we are hoping that many technology from the school students will also reach to the masses yeah thank you sir sir yeah so you said that the methods or methodologies that are given in the classical codified system you don't directly patent them right yeah so sir if you find that some methodology is quite good and uh, but you can't patent it so what uh, how will we preserve it uh, see the that is the classical codified system is the preserved system in fact you cannot file the patent in your name because it is your not it is not your ipr if some modification in the the you know the material or the use is there in fact where you could be establish the novelty and you could be able to prove that it is my system it is it is done by me it is my intellectual property then only you can be you know otherwise everything the the classical codified system is there in public domain so you cannot claim that it is my technology okay you must be uh, you know aware about the neem patent you must be aware about the haldi patent the us tried to file the patent on haldi for its antibiotic property and that time dr mashelkar you know so sent the notice in fact and the the patents were provoked based on that our traditional knowledge system is not patentable it is already there in public domain no can no one can claim that uh, uh you know it is it is it is mine on this okay because if you today if you file the patent that the patent is granted you would stop others to use that actually can you do in case of traditional knowledge definitely not only thing if you did certain experiments if you found novelty in any uh, you know how or anywhere in fact then only you can file the patent in your name okay Yes, sir. Sir, but if it is in the public domain, how is it? Ah, uh, how can we access it if we want? Uh, see, there is a traditional knowledge digital library maintained by CSIR. Okay, and they have compiled all the traditional knowledge practices there actually. So you, but uh, it is not accessible to the common people. It is accessible to all the, ah, uh, you know. the patent offices throughout world so tomorrow if somebody is trying to file the patent on the traditional knowledge of india it could be uh, you know stopped uh how you can get the access in fact either the monographs or uh, indian pharmacopoeia is already there so you can you can get the access through that only yeah thank you sir yeah sir Yeah. Yeah, Rakshit. For the human, sorry, the product is produced for the human consumption. What are the criteria want to observe, sir? Sorry, can you repeat your what is for human consumption? Sir, something like uh, for giving the antibiotics, something produced from the plants, or uh -huh. some antioxidants. 
what are the parameters you want to observe for from the, the uh, point of for uh, point of view sir okay see for that you have to go for the scientific experimentation if uh, there is a claim that it is having some antioxidant property so first is validation of innovators claim in fact through certain scientific experimentation and then you have to do some preclinical kind of work so that you could be established that okay efficacy is there but toxicity toxicity is not there many time it happens that uh, the certain medicines are certain plants are having medicinal property but they do they are toxic also so you cannot allow those uh, you know plants uh, for human consumption so there are there are there is a you know the process first the validation of innovators claim uh, second you have to establish this known toxicity uh, you know and then you have to go for different sort of trial phase one phase two phase three trials actually then only you would be able to launch the product in the market there are there are the guidelines in fact and you have to follow those guidelines only thank you sir yeah. any other questions students i guess that's all if uh, any other we are getting questions from students i will forward to you sure sure please thank all you right. thank you doctor for thank, thank, thank you please. so i can leave now uh, yes sir Uh, students, please uh, stay. We are having the next presentation. Our uh, guest will be arriving shortly. Okay. is in you can start introduction uh, good morning dr sir good morning doctor good morning everyone uh, students uh, we have the next session today uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Silpi Kocha. She is the senior manager for entrepreneurship development at Biotechnology Industrial Research Assistant Council, BIRAC, DBT. Uh, she specializes in managing grants and key requirements for growing business ecosystems. Uh, Dr. Silpi runs uh, several programs focused on uh, BIRAC's entrepreneurship spread, such as Ignition Grant and Regional Centers for Student Entrepreneurship Program. So without further delay, I invite Dr. Shilpi to take the stage. The floor is yours, Doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, so how was the day one of this yesterday? How did it go in the afternoon? I think it, it, was, it was good. It was good. Uh, we, we had uh, Mr. Chetan Patel and Ramesh Patel explaining about the BIDES programs and uh, Shodhya Atras, everything. Mm -hmm. And even network activities. Students were exposed to all these uh, basic grassroots innovations. And how are the students finding it? I would uh, request feedback from the students also. And those who can, please switch on the videos because it's difficult to interact with videos of you really uh, don't know please, who you are talking uh, switch to. Switch on your videos. There was a suggestion yesterday that you should all have uh, your names renamed with your institution name. 
so yeah. that you can I easily identify the students from um, the location. And so I request students to do that. Renaming can be done even while you are ending the trading. So try to rename yourself with your course is also good if you can name rename as you with your course and your institute name it will be good so i i can see some students have done it iit roorkee i can see uh, pmist vsftr yes, nicer yeah so it's a it's it's a very wide range it's a wide spectrum but students from very different locations so am i clearly audible to everyone can you give me a thumbs up students yes ma'am yes ma'am uh, so just show me your notebook and pen how many of you have today yesterday professor has suggested that we all should sit with a notebook and pen yeah. i always do that <laughs> we always do that okay so today you all have all right good um so today's session you know what the session is going to be about we'll keep it little interactive it let's not be monotonous let's not be only one side interaction from my side let's keep it as a chat and an interactive session would that be good yes ma'am you can answer by giving me no it's difficult to mute unmute every time just show your expressions by giving me thumbs up or something like that right okay so what that what is the talk that i will be presenting today what i am going to speak about any one of you role of birac for uh, uh, helping and supporting the startup culture or entrepreneurship in biotechnology okay so how many of you know about birac what is birac what is the full form of birac what does birac stand for can anyone answer birac stands for biotechnology industry research assistance council all right and i believe most of you all of you are from life sciences background only is that correct all of you have some element of biotechnology life sciences in your course curriculum right yes ma'am yes ma'am right area so the entire cohort belongs to that particular uh, domain right so if you we look at the full form of birac biotechnology industry research assistance council so we understand that the mandate of birac is to support biotech industry right and how we do it why we do it what the outcome has been and what we have been doing so far we'll discuss now during our my talk but has any one of you browsed through the birac website have you people gone through the website just say yes no in the chat box you can write down how many of you have browsed through birac website looks like none of you right so this is where i am actually yeah yes i got one yes so you one one student has browsed through two okay so since yesterday you had a talk by professor gupta the entire focus on has been for biis the purpose of attending biis and the mandate why we are here see birac website has all the information we can give you a document you can read through so that all can be done but why the purpose why we all are here and we are organizing this base is to arise that curiosity in you the habit of saying why why is it so why should i be attending this if you are attending this program you should ask yourself why am i attending this program what will be the outcome what is birac doing why should i attend this lecture by ms shilpi right you should ask yourself and habit this habit of asking why and not accepting things the way they are has there is a history of people who have been able to make a change who have this habit and this that inquisitiveness that curiosity is a must to bring in a change right so i would just suggest that for all things to come in future 
try to have this uh, habit of browsing through the website before you attend something. Whenever you go to attend a lecture, have a basic browsing and a basic understanding of it because it helps in then further understanding. You will have queries already in place. This lecture would have had been of higher value to you if you would have done some ground research already done, some bit of reading done about BIDAC. So never mind, we have, we are here for three weeks now and I can also come again and we can have the queries addressed. But for all lectures to come, I will suggest you, you have already have the course structure in place. So do some bit of research, some bit of reading at your end before you attend that lecture. Is that correct? Right? Okay. So I'll share my screen. I'll start with the talk and then we'll see what Barak is doing, how we are doing. Do I have share screen permission? Uh, yes, no, it should be. Yeah. All right. So the title is a little bit different, but it means the same, the translational ecosystem and Bayrak as an enabler to it. Um, so let's start from here. Do we agree to this? A man may die, nations may rise and fall, but an idea lives on. So what really lives on is an idea. And we will discuss, we'll talk a little bit here. We, I'll pause here and we'll talk about few ideas that have been brought in drastic change in our day-to-day -day lives in the recent past. We can, I'll just ask each one of you to give me one example of such small ideas that have changed your lives in the recent past. I'll just give you one or two examples which the on the to understand what I'm trying to say. For example, we have digital payments, Paytm, we have WhatsApp chat. Has it touched your lives? Has it changed the way we have been living for the last 10 years? Do you people agree? Yes, no? Yes, ma'am. You feel yes, that, that, is, yeah, that has brought in some change? Right? Imagine a situation where, for example, if we talk about Paytm, imagine a situation where uh, we wanted to buy something from a small uh, Redi Wala, Thela Wala, and we didn't have a cash in our hand. You want to park your car in a mall, you don't have cash in hand accidentally, maybe. So this happened with me quite a few times before Paytm came. So has it eased our life? It has eased our life, right? And it has make, made this uh, act of transferring money to very small remote locations. If you have your families down in the village, I have my, uh, I belong to a place where it's like, it's a native village and we send money very frequently to them now to Paytm. So has it eased us our lives now? So such ideas, which started with a very small innovation, it's not a very big innovation. And earlier, 10 years back, 12 years back, we used to think that, oh, if I, yeah, this Thela Vela can accept money through car. Um, I used to mock at my husband, actually. He say that he used to, he has a habit of carrying cards and not carrying cash. So this act of paying through a digital, now a Dairi Vela, Thela Vela will also accept money through Paytm. It's very common, even in Delhi, in every small cities as well. So it has eased. So can you all think of one such innovation that has eased your life? Let's take it as an let's take it as an assignment, Dr. Amar and Dr. Uh, Preme. You can just note down. Let's take it as an assignment. Each of the students should come up with one uh, such example from their day-to-day -day lives, which they think have has eased out their lives. Okay, doctor, we'll mention. Right? Yeah. And do a little bit of background research on that. And then in addition to that, think of another problem. These are the things which have been solved, but not all the problems have been solved. So you will see there are certain problems that do exist, many problems uh, still exist, which could be addressed, which could be solved, right? So there are three attitudes in life. If we talk about uh, there are three, there would be three ways of looking at it. When I used to think that this Thelawala can accept money through card, there were three ways. This is how things are. It's okay. Why should I, no, cash is important, right? It's very important to carry cash. Second way of looking at it is no, cash is not important. I, I believe things can change. There is a way to handle the situation. And third way is 
let me think of a solution right there are three ways of looking at any problem you come across so try to be in the third category whenever you see a problem or you see something is not okay you are there is a small bit of difficulty in handling it just don't try to accept it the way it is we all could have just said that no is aisa hi chalne do aisa hi hota hai my mother my grandmother they never chatted with anyone and we accepted nahi aisa hi hota hai but whatsapp has changed the way they they also deal with their lives now day to day they are so connected with their families their uh, relatives grandmother has her own circle my mother has her own circle now because of whatsapp right so think of such a uh, little bit of problems which you think you can change and try to be in the third category that let me think of the change right so with this thought let's hear to this presentation with this thought that whatever byrek offers byrek is an enabler if you have an idea you have a will to change something byrek acts as an enabler there are there's a plethora of schemes there is a there's a wide spectrum of scheme through which we are there to support you right from day 1 to the last day when you can when your product your technology will see the light of the day that is commercialization so we have schemes programs and various other opportunities networking available for you the options i'll i'll discuss that in the subsequent slides this is something i normally start my presentation with i see startups technology and innovation as exciting and effective instruments for india's transformation and this is what we have been discussing so far startups have brought in exciting and very revolutionary changes in the ecosystem already and they are set to bring so even during covid days we saw startup solutions coming in coming into the market and byrek has supported number of them so finally coming to what byrek is i have i had last for the last base also i had suggested that there should be an assignment on what byrek is doing there would be a question here to for you there will be an assignment so what byrek does what byrek is doing just excuse me for a second I'm sorry for this. Uh, so, Biotechnology Industry Research Assistance Council (BIRAC). So, what we are, we are a government of India enterprise. Uh, we are Section Eight not-for-profit company under Department of Biotechnology. We were set up in 2012, which is like 10 years back. We were set up. So, at that point of time, there was no such agency that was providing such kind of support. It has now become a central agency that is empowering the entire biotech innovation ecosystem in the country. including startups entrepreneurs medium and large scale companies and even larger companies for that matter with uh, mature ideas for commercialization and our focus has been on supporting the high risk innovations for development of affordable products for larger good of the society and when we talk about biotechnology it's a very wide term which includes right from healthcare and healthcare also the application of healthcare into other sectors industrial biotechnology agriculture waste management sanitation clean energy so when we talk when we say biotechnology it's a very wide term and it includes large number of uh, areas and aspects that uh, that is affecting the lives of people in any way and what byrek really offers we will see in the subsequent slides but i can sum it up by saying that there is innovation funding there is promotion and entrepreneurship development for creating a vibrant ecosystem there is risk investment and there is ip tech transfer training and capacity building and even there is support for product commercialization what you see in the on the right and left hand sides are the programs that we are also supporting in addition to our core and niche uh, schemes and programs which is mission covid suraksha incep mission make in india grand challenges india national nutrition mission national biopharma mission so let's see and understand what kind of change has there been for last 10 years byrac today stands as a central agency supporting this entire change and the
change that we have witnessed in the entire ecosystem, BIREC has been behind that as a pillar for that for bringing in that particular change. If you look at the number of biotech startups, it was way less than 50 in 2012. Today, we stand at a figure which is 100 times more. 5,000 is the number of biotech startups in the country. Biotech incubators, it's again, there's a tenfold change. There were less than six biotech incubators in 2012. Today, we have 60 plus bio incubators supported only by BIREC. There are many more other than BIREC supported as well. So innovation funding available to startups was less than CR today, 2,500 plus crores has been supported, has already been invested in the startups. Number of biotech products in the market were less than 10. Today, there is the 30, 50 plus products. And these are all listed out available. It's not just a number. Biotech clusters, there are seven biotech clusters, seven technology transfer offices. Number of core biotech companies. Companies, when we say they were less than 100, they're large scale companies. We're not talking about startups. They're more than 800 today. And the India's bioeconomy today stands at 70 billion US dollars, which was less than 10 billion US dollars in 2012. So there is a drastic, there's a radical shift that we are seeing in the biotech sector. And biotech sector of late has been called as a sunrise sector. And I believe I, you all would agree with me on saying this when we see this statistics. If we look at where are these entrepreneurs located, what BIREC has been supporting, they're all spread across the country. You see these dots, these dots represent where we are receiving applications from, our inflow of applications. So it's all across the country. It's a little bit more dense towards the south because South happens to be the biotech hub so far, but now it's also the northern part has is all is almost equally um, dense and competing with the south southern cluster. The ratio, the male female ratio, has been little uh, imbalanced to say. Seventy five percent applications are from male students and twenty five percent from female students, which we are trying to address now uh, through our various awareness programs and outreach programs. And if you look at the sectoral representation, healthcare happens to be the highest, the largest uh, supporter, re recipient of the support provided by BIRAC, followed by industrial and drugs and agriculture. So this is what the impact has been of the support provided by BIRAC. Today, BIRAC has supported more than 1,500 startups. There are 10,000 plus people who have been recruited, who have been supported as manpower from these projects. There are 150 plus marketed products and technologies, 60 bio incubators. And these startups which have been supported, 70, more than 75 of them have been able to raise further funding from the private venture investors, venture capitalists, angel investors. And this funding is to the tune of 500 crore plus. There have been more than 200 IPs filed by these startups. There are four regional centers. And our own funding support is, of, is to the tune of 2,000 crore plus. So all these figures, they collectively indicate towards a growing sector, towards a uh, sector which is the, which is, which, uh, an, which an aspiring and inspiring sector, a sector where which promotes entrepreneurship, which has a lot of scope of having uh, entrepreneurship as a career for you as students. So our schemes, if you look at our schemes, they, we support right from ideation to marketing. We have our, we have so well customized and adapted our schemes that we support each and every stage of development of the product development cycle. Especially in biotech sector, we all know there is a long gestation period and there are a lot of challenges involved. So the way we have customized, the BIREC has customized the schemes and grant pro programs is that we support right from ideation to proof of concept to early stage development to late stage development and right up to marketing. So you would not require information about all of these, but you have just to, for you to keep in mind that yes, there are provisions available. Once I have a product at that particular stage, there is support available. So the, that's the entire purpose of showing you this particular slide and the subsequent slides, which have information on these schemes as well. So what's of immediate relevance to you is the early stage programs, the student entrepreneurship programs with support from ideation to proof of concept. And that includes EUA, Sitare, social immersion program, and up to big. So if you know up to these schemes and the bioness bioincubation program, 
which provides an overall support. Subsequently, once you have a startup created, once you have already completed some bit of validation, early stage development, you can also take benefit from the mature schemes of the PIRAC, like SIBRI, BIVP, CRS. There are equity schemes also. If you look at the top uh, left corner, seed fund, leaf fund, ACE fund, product commercialization unit. So all of things, all of these things are there to support you, to enable you to take your innovation product technology to the market. This particular scheme you're already benefiting from. We have two components in this, Sitare, Gaiti and Sitare Appreciation Grant. So as Professor mentioned that 10 students out of the cohort from the best 10 will be receiving appreciation grant of one lakh each. So we have already had 10 such additions and we have awarded 190 students so far. And there used to be earlier grants provided without this as well. We have more than 200 such students supported through this program. And Sitare Gaiti, which is meant for PG students and doctoral students, PhD students. So there is an element of translational um, component, the commercial potential, where we focus upon setting up of start creation of startups. So there we, uh, we support projects by PG and PhD students. They are, these are uh, students who are pursuing this course and we award 15 such uh, projects every year with 15 lakhs. And these students are supported for their translational project. That idea should have an element of commercialization potential. So these are two uh, programs, these are two elements which are supporting biotech entrepreneurship at student level, at the university level. So similarly, we have another scheme, which is called EUA. And recently, currently, if you look at our website, there is a call for proposals open for EUA as well, EUA fellows. We have 10 EUA centers across the country, and you could locate a center that is near to your uh, place of residence or place of study. And we have two categories. What is relevant to you is the EUA fellows. Here, what is done is a team of five students can apply together as EUA fellow to any particular center that's near to you. And you'll be given a support, a limited support, a stipend for one year. This is for undertaking a project, right? Just a prototype creation or proof of concept generation within a period of one year. So you'll be guided by a mentor and a team of three to five students can apply together, maybe from the same college, from different colleges. You can just build up a multidisciplinary team and then you can apply as EUA, Fellows, we already have this uh, call for this open till 31st of March. I'll encourage you all to read about these scheme guidelines and the uh, advertisement also. If you are interested, we welcome you to apply for this. And the EU centers will can provide all the necessary guidance for application submission also. These EU centers are also supported by the Bionis incubators as EU knowledge partners. So as part of EUA fellows, if you are selected during that one year training, you'll also get a chance and opportunity to visit uh, these Binance incubators. You, you'll work at EUA centers and you will also get training and virtual uh, virtual training as well as on-site training from these Binance incubators as well. So then coming to our flagship scheme, which is Biotechnology Ignition Grant, BIG which the uh, professor was mentioning yesterday also. This is one of the rare schemes of the government which provides, which bets on ideas by individuals. So here, what we really do is we promote entrepreneurship at a very early stage level where you just need to be a graduate in any discipline. You have an idea, you, you think you can make, you, that idea can make a difference. You can apply to BIG scheme and we support you with 50 lakhs for a duration of 18 months. The currently call for BIG is also open. So anybody in your circle, maybe if you are pursuing graduation, anybody from your seniors, from your family who has an idea, who is into the life sciences domain and wish to apply for this, kindly spread this message and be the ambassadors for uh, bringing in a change. So what we hear the eligibility is any individual with a graduation or a startup up to five years of existence can apply. So, so far 20 calls have been uh, announced for BIG and we have processed more than 8,000 applications. 
this be implemented through our eight BIG partners located across the country. In case in, you wish to know more about the scheme, you can reach out to any of these eight partners. And in addition, there are 11 associate partners also who can easily provide you information and mentoring for the application submission part. All this information about the contact details and who they are, where they are located, it's all available on the BIREC website. So as I said, we have processed more than 7,000, 8,000 applications and we have supported close to 700 uh, projects under BIG. 150 new startups have been, support, have been created just out of the project supported by BIG. More than 200 IPs have been filed, 75 plus startups have received follow-on funding and close to 60 products are in market uh, just supported by BIG. So BIG is a very early stage funding program which supports right at an idea stage. So it's, it's a rare thing that right from BIG, we have 60 to 70 products which are in market. We, uh, BIREC has committed over 300 crores to the scheme for startups. Then coming to the our BIONES scheme, which is a backbone of all the schemes because when you have an idea, you want to work on it. The first question that came, comes to your mind is where do I work? What do I do? What do I do? Where do I get access to those equipments, those facilities? I don't have it in my institute. I need to. I need to go somewhere else. I need to. I need this equipment. I, my institute doesn't have this facility. So where do I go? So there is a network of bio incubation created by the scheme BioNest, where we have sixty bio incubators supported across the country, and these bio incubators provide you with world class facilities, equipments, mentoring network access and whatever in whatever mentoring you require whether ip legal or some clarity on what should i do connect with a mentor all these in, all this support is provided by the bionest incubation system, system and the list of these 60 by incubators is there on our BIREC website so these are the names written in very small font you can you if, you, if it's visible, it's good. Otherwise, we'll be sharing these slides with you. So as I mentioned, we have more than 1,500 incubators supported through this Bionest incubator network. 700 plus products are in market created by these 1,500 incubators. And more than 1,100 IPs have been filed. So all take, uh, taken together, these incubators offer a space which is more than 6 lakh square feet. So that's enough. That's a big figure and a big uh, ecosystem created by BIRAC through this BIONES scheme. 10 out of these 60 are focused only on agriculture. In case any of you is interested in just in doing an agri, agri project. So these are the 10 BIONES incubators providing support, particularly in that domain, in the agriculture sector. So now we look at the kind of Funding support, as we mentioned, right, starting from 1 lakh to 15 lakhs to 50 lakhs. At each stage, the requirement is different. The kind of uh, support you require at different stages of your startup um, chain is different. So from a fellowship grant of, to the tune of 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 under EUA scheme to 15 lakhs under Sitare, then we go up to 50 lakhs under BIC. And then we have equity support of 30 lakhs under SEED once you have a startup then it can go up to even 7 CR under the ACE fund, 5 CR under the PCU. So this is just to give you an idea that, yes, once you have a prod, once you have an idea and there is a clarity of how you want to take it forward, BIRAC has a complete chain, complete path worked out for you where you can easily support, easily we can we'll support your, uh, your idea, your innovation through whatever best we can do. So these slides I'll be just skipping. These are just for the information purpose that there are schemes available for startups and SMEs after beyond the startup age. Uh, as per DPIT, their startup age is taken as 10 years. So, and Biotech anyways has a longer gestation. Under BIG, we take it as five years. But typically once you have a startup period over, you have SME, your, your company is at a stage of SME or a 
larger company we have schemes like sbiri and bipp there to support you these are just this is a glimpse of what the schemes have supported so far i think somebody is awaiting to uh, enter the room dr amarath if you can yeah we will we'll check just admit her i'll be skipping these few slides but this will be available as the document provide in the document provided to you the slide deck that will be shared these things will be there so pace is another scheme where we support faculty entrepreneurs you can possibly have a word with your guides your mentors that there is a scheme of bairak which is available for academicians also here there are two components air and crs under air a faculty alone can apply for a project and under crs uh, you need to have an industry involvement for validation an academician along with an industry can come then there is another scheme which is called social innovation immersion program this is also for students wherein there is a six month immersion at the clinic in the clinical setup provided so as you see there is 50000 per month fellowship is there Five uh, lakhs of Kickstart grant has given clinical and rural immersion in settings. Uh, immersion is done in the clinical and rural settings. There is an access to Bayrak network, and there are fourteen such centers set up across the country. So you could also uh, look uh, for the further details of this program on the Bayrak website. Then comes the equity programs, which are for once you have an idea. validated and then the investments are made into the company through seed leap ace and bio angels so how, how bayrak really implements this is through our strategic partnerships we have lot of partners across the country and even out of the country across the globe as you would see the logos of these partners these are the core strength of bayrak we implement our schemes we leverage their network available we leverage their strengths we have partnership in various domains in various sectors in the public in the government and across the globe which through which we uh, are benefit our startups and these partnerships are the core strength of the bayrak another support which is provided by bayrak is through the mentoring and the skill development so it's not only whatever we discussed so far was about the funding programs so this is another vertical through which bayrak provides support which is through the uh, high end skill development and that is done through various workshops conducted directly by bayrak and through our partners including big partners eu us centers siip partners and the residential workshop is one such example and then we have these workshops in the core technical domains so there are very niche technical workshops conducted by bayrak in the areas of uh, regulatory ip there are challenges in a particular area announced and then we uh, have proposals where you where you as students and startups come and for uh, the there is a residential program for 5 to 10 days done and there is a hackathon where you sit where you reside there and develop a prototype so there is a lot of mentoring uh, and lot of networking offered by pyrek for startups which is must for enabling anybody to develop the product and innovation so these are some examples of the global partnerships and the global exchange programs that pyrek offers to the startups we have exchange programs with us uk finland sweden and through all of these lot of uh, startups have already been benefited in the past few years you look at the pictures there is a bio us program there is a program called slush there is a program called ignite where we send five startups every year to judge business school in cambridge so all of this give you an example give you an idea of what kind of support does bayrak offer to student entrepreneurs and startups so with this in mind you could try and have your path uh defined for you for like next 3 to 5 years on if you want to have entrepreneurship as a career what is there as uh, being offered to you by barack and other government agencies so this is an example of 
our core biotech strengths of the country. Global Bio India was a mega event that we organized in 2019 for the first time, where we had 3,000 plus delegates and 800 plus business meetings. So this is this actually proves that today bio, India is ready to showcase its biotech strengths to the country, to the entire world, not to the country, to the um, entire world rather. We had participation from 25 countries in this uh, platform. This was a, actually, this was done physically, but the second edition had to be conducted virtually because of COVID. So in 2021, we had the second edition of GBI, wherein it was attended by 10,000 plus delegates virtually, and the participation from the countries across the globe also increased. Then this is an example of our Women Entrepreneurship Support Program. There is a program called Biotech Winner Reward Women in Entrepreneurial Research, where we award 5 lakh to 15 women entrepreneurs every year. And these 15 entrepreneurs then go through an accelerator program. And three winners of, out of these are then awarded 25 lakh each. So far, 45 such women entrepreneurs have been awarded. Then coming to the regulatory support, we see that there is a biotech as by very nature, there are a lot of regulatory challenges involved, whether it's healthcare sector, whether it's agriculture sector. So each, each of these uh, subsectors also have a lot of regulatory hurdles, a lot of regulatory challenges. So BIREC realized that very soon, very early in the beginning, in the, in the early, early days, and we set up a first hub, which is a facilitation unit where startups, entrepreneurs can directly have a word with the regulatory authorities, including authorities at DBT, BIREC, ICMR, CDSCO. They sit there and then and they resolve their queries. So that is called as first hub. And anybody can interact with the um, regulators through a prior appointment. So now there, there are some examples of the kind of BIREC support that was given to startups and where the, those startups stand today. So in the last 10 years, there has been a very major change in the financial status, in the commercial penetration status of these startups. If I say there are 100 and plus, 150 plus products in the market, there is a website created by Bayrag where all of these products and technologies are listed. And all of you should go through that website and have a look on what kind of products have been developed by these startups. There are companies which have exceeded a sale of 50 CR, 10 CR, 1 to 10 CR. There are a number of such startups. So these are some of the names that have been supported, the company names and the product names. Then there are sectoral um, startups, which are examples. There are first-in-class discoveries also. There are agriculture startups. There are in varied sectors, we have success stories. So this is the website, www.biotech-solutions.com, where we feature these 150 plus commercialized products and technologies. They give you a complete understanding of what this product is about, how it can help, and what it really offers to the end user. So I'll encourage you all to web browse through this website today and get an understanding of what are these technologies about. There are a few case studies which I would like to share with you. Uh, there were students like you. There were students who were little ahead of you who came to Bayrak who have now been so successful that they have investments in the range of 100 CR plus in their company by angel investors. So these case studies are so inspiring that I thought that I will share will a share few case studies. And as Dr. Suroop yesterday mentioned, there is a book, Star by Rick Star Innovators. Some of these also feature into that booklet and Professor Gupta and team maybe can share that book with all of you for reading. So these are some of the uh, fellows who are into the SIB program. There's a program called Stanford India Biodesign, jointly run by the IIT Delhi, Ames, and Stanford University. So these fellows, they have been successfully, successfully commercialized their technologies. And just a few examples, there are many more. These are some examples of the, those fellows who did not think about, they were just uh, addressing a problem, but they finally landed up with a solution and they could also commercialize their technology as well. So there is a hearing loss screening device for neonates. There is a newborn resuscitation device. There's a very, this, this was a very simple problem identified by Dr. Avijit Bansal of resuscitation. For a newborn, when you are resuscitating, the, both the hands of the nurse used to be 
uh, involved, engaged with the with handling the child. So you need to have involvement of one or two or three to four people for resuscitating a, a, new, a, a newborn. In the low resource settings, in the primary healthcare settings, there is a crunch of manpower. And usually, typically, there is one nurse or one person handling the child. So what the kind of innovation that he has brought in is that the device can now be operated by foot instead of hand. Earlier, the device used to be completely handheld. So he has converted that handheld device to foot-operated device. So it's an incremental innovation, but it has a la very large impact. So now the product is commercialized, it's there in the market, it's there in hospitals. Then there is a flexible cast for fractured bone commercialized by Mr. Pankaj Chatrala. So as we all know, the kind of plaster that we put on when there's a fracture, it's not breathable, it, it's not washable. So there is a lot of allergy and a lot of discomfort that is there using that kind of a, a plaster. So now he has developed a flexible cast. So this, there are a lot of features that makes it easy to use. So that's, this is the kind of innovation he has brought in. You can wash it easily. You can easily, uh, this is breathable. It doesn't lead to infections. And the kind of ease which is there with using, this is currently only for the wrist and he's developing now for other parts as well. Then these are young scientists who have, who are turned into entrepreneurs. This is a case study I suggest all of you to go through and maybe many of you would know about Pandorum. It start, this is a startup which has investments from IEN and other foreign investors as well. And raised funding from Flipkart also. Tohin and Anun Chandru, which ma'am also mentioned yesterday. They, like, they received funding from BT Able Best Program to BIG to BIPP. And now Angel Investment and Venture Capitalist Investments are there. Then there is uh, Achira Labs by Dr. Dhananjay. There is Cutting Edge Technologies by Dr. Pankaj Parashar. He was inspired by his family problem. His sister had an issue which he, uh, he wanted to change. He wanted to address that issue. And he has developed this device, which is a point of care device. And now the product is in market. He, there is a global visibility of this device. Then not only just students or young scientists, we have various examples where uh, leaders from the corporate world have left their high and well-paying jobs and that spirit of entrepreneurship and bringing in a change and, and to be able to uh, carry forward their passion. They have set up their own startups, their enterprises, and today those products are in market. So even after having a stint of like 20 years, 30 years with companies like GE, Mahindra, these people quit their jobs. They came to a low paying 50,000 per month kind of a startup salary that they were getting, but it took five, seven years, but they have been able to convert their passion, their idea into a product, into a marketable product. So these are some of the examples. Then there are social entrepreneurs. So as I said, Bayrek has supported N number of startups and in various sectors. Pavan Venrotra, he left his again well-paying job. He was a cancer biologist, but he was driven by, by a problem. He, he was taken aback to see the breast cancer survivors. There was no solution for breast cancer survivors. The, the, he has developed a very affordable and a customized breast processes for the survivors of breast cancer. Then a faculty at Bits with Pilani who has developed a customized 3D processes. <clears throat> then there is a $1 device by an oncosurgeon, a Vishal Rao. The company name is Innovation. So there is a voice processes for people who lose their voice due to throat cancer. So it's such so affordable that it's just a small, um, it's a small piece which can be easily inserted into the throat at as affordable as 50 to 70 rupees. The entire cost of surgery and everything inclusive, that also comes to a few thousands, which can be even afforded by uh, people in the rural settings. And that can help people who lost their voice 10 years, 20 years back, and they can restore their voice. It's such a great innovation that has touched the lives of people. So with a large societal impact. So these are some of the examples of the kind of impact that Bayrak has brought in over the last few years. So this is the last slide where we will be discussing on how we further see going three years down the line, four years down the line, the kind of scaling that we are forcing 
the kind of opportunities that exist for you as students in this sector. So today there is a very promising um, ecosystem scenario which did not exist 10 years back. Today you have so many opportunities available which can support you to carry forward entrepreneurship as a career, which did not probably exist five years, 10 years back. And going further, the sector is set to rise to, uh, to further grow many fold. The kind of change we are expecting is 2x, 4x, 50x. So I would urge you all, I would inspire you all to carry, to, if you have an idea, just believe in that idea and agencies like BIRAC and other government agencies are there to support you, to help you, to take that innovation to the market. And we, you have, we, I have discussed the case studies. There are already examples there where people like you have brought in that innovation, that change in the day-to-day -day lives. So I'll stop here and what we'll do is we can take up the queries or maybe we can have another round for queries if time doesn't permit. But I wanted to have some kind of an interaction with or with you all, maybe today or if that can be done later, I'll, I'll leave that to Sishti to decide. Students, if you have any queries, you can ask Dr. Shilpi now. Or you can also send us your queries. Good afternoon, ma'am. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, ma'am, I had a doubt. Uh, so you talked about EUA. Yes. So that is an annual thing? Yes, the first call for EUA has been announced uh, on 26th of January this year. So that was the first call, but it will be an annual event now. So every year we'll be announcing that call. Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I looked up the page for EUVA and it talks about some EUVA centers. So it is required. Is it required that uh, our institution should be registered as well for us to? No, no, no. These centers are the nodal points where you will be working. These are the anchors. So you will be working as the EUVA fellow. You um. See, you, uh, EUA fellows are the students who are pursuing their undergraduation. So you won't be working full time with the EUA centers naturally. You have your studies. So the kind of uh, structure we have kept for EUA scheme is that you'll have you'll be working in spurts at the EUA centers. So those uh, centers will provide you a pre-incubation facility. They have a little bit of setup there where you can go maybe during your um, summer break, winter break, autumn break for three days, five days in a week, week time, 10 days, whatever time you can take out from your studies. You can go and visit that center. You can work there. And if there is another specialized requirement, you the center can connect you further with the biologist incubator also. So, but you just have to be attached with a center. You lot, uh, otherwise, if your own lab is equipped, you can just conduct your, the work at your own lab and you can apply with an idea that this is something I want to work on at my own lab. And if required, you can also go to EUA center and the BioNest incubator. Otherwise, you just have to apply to a center who will be involved in releasing the stipends, mentoring your work progress and everything during the year. You just have to, for from your side, your college has should have an e-cell. Having an e-cell is must for EUA. Thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Um, I have a query. Um, like a basic doubt, uh, what is the difference between the BioNest incubators and the other incubators um, of BIRAC? So all the incubators supported by BIRAC are under BioNest itself. BioNest is the scheme name under which we support bioincubators. In I okay. there are other incubators other than BIRAC supported ones. So there are a lot of incubators itself. We may not call it as bio incubators, but there are a lot of incubators supported by DST and other agencies. Uh, it's a very common, um, it's a very common word and common thing in the other sectors like IT and uh, e-commerce and other sectors. Incubation is very common, but bio incubation requires a lot of specialized equipment and infrastructure. So bio incubation becomes a little more specialist, specialized and uh, specific with specific needs. So uh, BioNest is the scheme offered by BIREC through which we have supported these 60 bio incubators. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Any other questions? So what I will actually suggest is that I will share this uh, slide deck. You share it further with all the students. Okay. And of them should uh, browse through the Bayrek website. They should know what all kind of, I must have, it's not possible to include everything that Bayrek offers in the slide deck. But there are so many things available on our website, the COVID solutions, the publications. Let them go through the Bayrek brochure. Then there are Bayrek publications on the success stories, the startups. So let them read through that and the biotechsolutions.com. So uh your own sector, maybe if you're doing BSc agriculture, I could read one of your other students who's doing a BSc agriculture, just pick up the agri section of the biotechsolutions.com. Have a look at the kind of solutions, the kind of innovations that the startups are uh, these days coming up with. So that will give you an idea of what the startup ecosystem in the agriculture sector is. Similarly, the student who's currently pursuing a degree in life sciences or uh, maybe physiology or biochemistry or microbiology. Just look at the uh, medical devices, drugs, and industrial biotech section on what kind of innovations are coming up these days. So have, a, have an understanding and then try to see what kind of, what, what your idea is, what, your, what, what kind of innovation can you bring in, or what is the kind of problem that your, maybe some of you would belong to a region where there could be a problem specific to that region. It may not be a problem at a larger level, but there's a problem specific to that particular region. So is there something that you can do, some kind of innovation, some kind of change that you can bring in for that particular specific problem that people are facing? So come up with such ideas. And at the end, during the presentation, they should have one section on what kind of a problem or an innovation idea that they could come up with. Uh, okay, doctor, we'll advise the students to visit the Bayrak website and we'll give this an assignment. So and get yes. them yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for sharing. You can space. also have a quiz organized on Yes, like, thanks, Doctor. Yeah, we are uh, planning. For example, today I the one student asked me like about EUA. So you ask them uh, later on in a quiz. So what does EU offer? What's the amount of stipend that is offered? What is an EUA center? What is a Bionist incubator? So let them be equipped with these words. Let them understand these words. So at okay. the end of these three weeks, they should have information. They should have knowledge about what Bayrek really offers so that they could be, there are many things which they themselves can benefit from and then they can be the ambassadors for Bayrek. They would, you would, when you go back to your college, your studies, you'll interact with so many people. You can, you can further share this information and tell them that this is available in the ecosystem. Let's work together for addressing a problem. There are, there are so many, so much of support mechanism available. So let them convey this, let them share this information further with their peers, with their friends, relatives, other their faculty, and so on. Sure, sure. So I think that there are no more questions. We could yes, close this. Yeah, we, yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for your wonderful presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, students, uh, please uh, wait on the line. We have the next session starting in another five minutes. Okay.
डॉक्टर प्रेमनाथ सर आर यू विद अस यस सर या थैंक्स थैंक्स फॉर कमिंग ओके स्टूडेंट्स नाउ वी आर स्टार्टिंग द नेक्स्ट थर्ड सेशन ऑफ द डे uh now we have with us uh, dr premnath venukopalan he is the head uh, of uh, ncl innovations at uh, csir ncl and also the founder director of venture capital which is a national award winning uh, enterprises uh, and a deep tech incubator so dr premnath is a technology developer uh, innovation and incubation manager startup mentor and a co-founder of two medtech startups Uh, his journey in technology development began with a breakthrough material for hip and knee joint uh, replacements that have been implanted in more than a million patients worldwide he is a basically a, he is a chemical engineer and an alumnus of mit us and iit bombay and has been challenging technology enterprise scholar in cambridge uk uh, so let's welcome dr premna uh, dr premna the floor is yours yeah um thank you can you see my slides uh yes doctor visible okay so let's get started uh first of all uh, let me uh thank uh swishti for inviting me to speak always happy to speak to students can i understand a little bit about the uh, Uh, audience first so a quick poll on the chat box also to wake you all up uh can i so here is a question on the chat box right so how many uh can you those who those who are uh, studying uh, i mean first of all those who are students right say yes so can i understand okay um are there any faculty here um no doctor only for students only students okay all are uh, mostly undergraduates from okay. various disciplines of science and technology okay and uh, how many of you are uh, studying science and how and i will separately i want to know how many engineering but how many are in sciences another round of yeses okay good so it looks like uh, uh, would you say uh, uh, would you say that uh, just to the organizers would you say that it's about half and half of science and engineering uh, mostly science science background okay okay let's get started right yeah. so um, um the organization uh, that i represent is venture center and csir ncl the national chemical laboratory in pune uh this is the uh, venture center that you see here we're celebrating 15 years so this is our 15th year uh, anniversary and we are supported by dst and byrac we are home to a byrac bio uh, incubator byrac bionest as well just like shrishti is so the topic today i have chosen to speak to you about is building biotech startups how to get started and how to leverage bio incubators like the bionests uh, that there are there in several different locations <clears throat> okay um what i'm going to try and do is to first tell you a little bit about business um itself uh, assuming that some of you are here because you're interested in setting up a business i'll tell you a little bit about startups especially biotech startups which come under the category of deep tech science based businesses startups and then uh, we'll talk about how you could get started a few pointers and how you could leverage the uh, incubators so let's get going right away so when you talk about a business uh, many of you will commonly understand if you think of a factory for example you're taking some raw materials in and then you produce something of value there's a value addition that happens and uh, that company that you have is basically an asset a productive asset right which takes something in 
produces something of greater value. So you have created some value addition in the process and that's what results in wealth. So business essentially in all businesses that, that engine exists, even if it's a services business, for example, like Infosys, the engine is primarily people and the software tools and their intangibles. Uh, if it's a company like Reliance, there's a lot of assets which are of um, like factories to produce this chemical, that chemical, that petrochemical and so on and so forth. Okay, so at the heart of a business is this kind of productive engine. And the reason they are producing this is because this product or service is solving a need or a problem for somebody, right? So all businesses solve problems for a customer, uh, small or big, even the ones which are your Kirana shops near your house do the same thing, which is that they are making it convenient for you to get your products, right? So that, that's a very key element of having uh, a business, which is you're solving a problem for somebody. Somebody values that you are providing a solution to them and therefore they are willing to pay for it. Okay. And that's how a business operates, right? Um, and usually this is a story of a business. In most cases, you'll find that you, when you start a business, you end up investing your efforts, your time, maybe some money into your uh, effort. That's the one that is shown here below the x-axis. That's a, you're going into the red, investing some money, and then you climb out and at the end of it, there is a reward. Because you're investing without knowing what's uh, entirely sure about what's coming ahead, there is a risk involved. If the risk is high, typically the rewards are also high, right? So there's no such, as Americans call it, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? If you don't want to take risks, your chances of uh, rewards will also be diminished because wherever there's not uh, risk also, you will find that a lot many more people will crowd together, right? So there'll be more competition as well, uh, usually. So the risk goes along with rewards. And this area about the curve is the reward. And the idea about building a business is to increase, is to ensure that your rewards are higher than the risks that you're undertaking or the costs that you're incurring. And therefore, it makes it worthwhile to run a business, right? So that's the basic uh, idea behind a business. As, an on, as a business person, what you do typically is that you're telling the story to people who are investing in you or trusting your products and so on and so forth, that you have a viable storyline out here, that this will happen the way you're draw, draw, drawing it on this graph. Therefore, investors also think that it's worth investing and therefore they want to partake in the potential reward that can accrue some part of it, which will accrue to those uh, investors as well, right? So a uh, simple lesson here, uh, is that every business, there is a certain amount of risk that everybody takes, and then you build some rewards out of it. Um, in different business sectors, the, the amount of risk can be small or high. Uh, for example, in a typical IT company, if it's a services company, your risk might be much, low, much lower because you're working with some computers, some people, and so on. You don't have to invest in a lot of capital expenditure. If it's a biotech company, you might need to invest quite a lot in uh, different uh, 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 different facilities, different capabilities, get it approved, uh, regulatory uh, clearances are needed and so on and so forth. So the cost can be high. So risk is high. So typically, uh, most uh, businesses in the biotech sector will be also high rewards uh, kinds of uh, businesses. If it doesn't deliver that reward, uh, then people will not take that risk. So it, it doesn't make it worthwhile for them. They'll go for other things where they can get uh, similar rewards with less risk, right? Okay. And this, the tradition of building businesses with science exists in India for many, many years. And, you know, in the chemicals and life sciences and bio and pharma space, uh, Dr. Praful Chandra Ray started the Bengal Chemical Works in 1892. And this was one of the earliest, you know, the modern chemicals and pharmaceuticals companies uh, in uh, uh, India. So it's not like it's absolutely new to us or it's uh, we have we have a tradition of business for many, many years. Indians have always been very good in business, uh, in trading primarily. But when it came to science-based businesses, uh, we were late starters and we have learned along the way. But it is happening with a lot of achievements along the way as well. So some of you might be familiar with uh, uh, some of these uh, people here, right? So while I talk through this slide, maybe some of you can identify the people here. Let me see how many people can 
can you identify? Of course, one or two will be giveaways, but anybody knows any names here? You do know the Ambani's, the Adani's, the maybe the Tata's and so on. How about these ones? These are science businesses. Scientific. Other Punawala. Yeah, good. On the chat box, any more? You can see other Punawala there. Anybody, anybody else? Kiran Majumdar Shaw. Yes. Anybody else? Kamal Anji Reddy. Yes, Dr. Anji Reddy. By the way, Dr. Anji Reddy is an alumnus of NCL. So I have a special reason for putting him over there. But Dr. Reddy's, the pharma company, was founded by him. Anybody else in this? I'm sure you can identify at least one or two more. The gentleman here with the syringe should be easy. Pramod Chaudhary. Pramod Chaudhary is here, yes. Praj, that's below, right? So. By the way, Praj is the largest industrial biotech company in India, and it represents, it is res responsible for 8% of the world's bioethanol production, okay? So it's no small feat, right? In the first generation entrepreneur uh, in this field. And how about this name here? I'm surprised. Dr. Krishna Ella, Bharat Biotech, no? Okay, right. Meher Padamji of Thermax. And uh, here you can see Keki Gharda of Gharda Chemicals, right? So these are some in uh, the chemicals, biotech, and the uh, life sciences space. So I listed some of them here, but there are many like this, right? So the people who are building such businesses were taking immense risk. Uh, and you know, you heard about the story of risk taken by Adar Punawala or Krishna Ella. Uh, during the course of uh, uh, this last year. Can you hear me? I just got a message that my connection is unstable. So I'm just wondering, can you hear me? Uh, yes, Dr. Bhai. Okay, good. Okay. So let's continue. So this, of course, as I told you, this is Dr. Krishna Ella and the Covaxin, Bharat Biotech. Um, you know, uh, a biotech uh, expert who has built uh, this company over... Uh, um, uh, over uh, uh, you know, the last many years, and you saw the effect of it, the great achievements only in the last uh, uh, year in, in, in full, uh, uh, you know, with, in, in, with full impact uh, during this year as well. So there are also a class of enterprises called social enterprises. Now, this, in social enterprises, uh, you will find that there is another y-axis, which is you, of course, the first y-axis for every business has to be money, which is that you have to make sure it is viable at the end of the day. Uh, otherwise, you don't have a story at all. But then there is impact also, which people are concerned about. They build businesses also to have impact. And impact can be in different forms. You might be saving lives. You might be creating jobs. Uh, you might be, uh, uh, you know, um, helping save the environment in some way. Uh, and so there are many, many, many things that are possible. Now, the second uh, y-axis really is interesting to many young people and many people. And there are many, many examples of those kind of companies also. In many ways, all companies do have some impact, okay? Some have impact uh, where, where uh, you know, despite the monetary returns not being so great, people deliver impact, right? And that is something which we should also be looking at, of course, because otherwise you would not be addressing certain problems which are important in society, but uh, may not necessarily be the most lucrative uh, opportunities out there. So those are also interesting, but you have to, of course, make the first y-axis work, which is financially it has to be sustainable, right? Good example of this is Amul, right? Amul is a for-profit company. Okay, it makes profits, but you can see the social impact that it delivers, the number of people it employs, the number of uh, uh, dairy farmers whose income has increased considerably, the number of people like you and me who get uh, products which, uh, we've, which would have been more, a lot more expensive if it wasn't for uh, uh, Amul, 
right? And such companies uh, as well. So these are examples. And uh, some of you, as your young students, please do read this biography of Dr. Varghese Kurian, I Too Had a Dream, which is a very interesting read. So please do uh, read that as well. Here is another example. This is a company, this is a startup from Venture Center. Uh, this is in the outskirts of Pune. It's a company called Nobel Exchange. What you're seeing is a plant which processes uh, uh, organic waste from Pune city, which is segregated in Pune city, treats it, converts it into bio CNG and supplies it to Indian oil corporation, which supplies it for buses in the Pune region. Okay, so bio CNG driven buses. So this you can imagine is of course a very tough business since you're dealing with municipal corporations, waste uh, and uh, PSUs who are supplying all these gases and so on. But nonetheless, uh, this is something which is very exciting, which uh, is a 300 tons per day capacity uh, plant uh, running in Pune uh, today. And of course, uh, this was the pioneer after which the government introduced the Satat program. Um, and uh, that has now become uh, the uh, uh, it's trying, they're trying to roll it out all over the country uh, as well. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, um, let's talk a little bit about startups. Okay, so a key element of uh, startups, uh, which are basically a type of business. Okay, it, this is just a category of businesses. Not all businesses are startups, and you should definitely not mix up traditional small businesses and MSMEs with startups. Okay, uh, startups work on opportunities where they see a future opportunity. Right, these are future opportunities which you are betting on will happen. So there's uncertainty and risk associated with it, right? It is not today's opportunity. So for example, when Uber got started, they bet on the fact that people will want to have these kind of car services and people one day may not want to even own cars, right? That's the bet that they took. Whether it happens differently or not is not a diff is a different matter. Or if you take Elon Musk for example, the bet that space business is going could be privatized and that it need not be something which only NASA can do or an ISRO can do uh, is something which is a big bet, right? Nobody would believe that. Uh, it, Ten years back, nobody would believe the EV story. Also, right? Uh, we have a startup as I will show you, which works on EVs and. Uh, uh, it for two wheelers and about just about uh, five years back, uh, nobody was willing to believe that it will take off and nobody was sure when it will take off. Today, the situation has changed entirely. So startups very often uh, and usually and the, in most cases, there will be foresight behind that opportunity, right? So they're looking into the future. Now, if you're an entrepreneur, imagine if you were to foresee the future, you have to convince yourself that that's an opportunity and you should be fairly clear that there may not be too many people who believe you, right? Uh, you have to convince yourself. Uh, you don't want to be on a shaky wicket yourself, but you should be clear that you might be alone uh, in that journey as well. Now, if since it's the future and that's not happened yet, uh, and since people have not yet shaped it, uh, there is a need for an innovation very often. So it will either be an organizational innovation or that's called a business process innovation or a technical novelty or what is what you commonly known, know as an invention, a scientific invention, for example, right? And that is what enables the future. So that becomes another element of a startup. Right. The other thing you will often see is that opportunity will usually appear small. So when Musk started uh, electric vehicle, uh, uh, his electric vehicle journey with Tesla, uh, General Motors, Toyota, all were working on it, but they didn't think it was big enough to invest resources or to push it. OK, but. Elon Musk thought it was big enough, right? So it appears small in the beginning. It's unlike people will tell you it's unlikely, it's impossible, it's unpopular. All of that will come up, right? And uh, you as an entrepreneur are the believer, the true believer working, walking that path. And the initial journey is very lonely for the entrepreneur. It's a test of, uh, you know, it's a really a test of faith and resilience in your uh, idea. And that's where most entrepreneurs really get uh, tested. So. Let me just on the chat box, let me ask you, since all of you must be using some of these products. Um, do you know that there were two companies which bet on the on the idea that one day personal computers will be big? 
right? This was the time when IBM uh, used to think that only mainframe computers used to work, right? Do you know those two companies which bet uh, at a time when nobody believed them that personal computers will be big? Everybody will own a computer in the house and work with it, right? Any, any answers on the chat box? Two early pioneers of personal computing. More answers. Any more? All of you use their products. Many of you do. Yes, Apple and Microsoft, right? Apple bet on the hardware, Microsoft bet on the software, right? That that software for small com small computers would be important, right? So this is common across the board, right? Uh, even in Indian companies who copied same models from the West, they bet that India was ready for it, right? So examples of that is Flipkart, right? They bet that India was ready for e-commerce. Another example for it is Ola, right? They bet that India was ready for an Uber model. Paytm, right? They bet that India was ready for a, uh, uh, for, uh, you know, a PayPal kind of a model, right? Now, that bet is also not easy to do, huh? even though you're uh, copying a general uh, mechanism of working, uh, to make the bet that this is the time to do it is extremely hard, and it's, you need to convince yourself that this is the time to do it. Now, because it starts small, and you're looking at a big opportunity, there's always scaling in it. So if most of these startups scale very quickly, okay? You don't know when it'll scale, but it will scale very rapidly, okay? Uh, the other thing, the interesting thing that happens in startups is that the, there's a so-called an entrepreneur mindset. And that entrepreneur mindset basically is this, that entrepreneurs imagine what is possible and then they say, I'll get the resources to make it happen. They don't say, I have this much money, I have this much knowledge, what can I do with it? Okay, so this is a very important lesson for some of you that you should not limit yourself to what is available with you. Entrepreneurs have to think of the possibilities, not of what is within reach, right? And that's another very important characteristic of a startup. And the potential to scale up, basically the fact that it scales rapidly and the fact that there's risk associated with not knowing when it will scale or which one will scale means that it attracts risk capital. And that is why you see venture capital firms lining up to invest in such companies. So you see, for example, a Zomato being funded uh, when it is in loss. Why? Because they know it's going to, they are betting that it's going to take off someday, right? And that someday they don't know yet but they will bet on it that that's going to happen because people are going to increasingly order things. There's a delivery systems will be increasingly important as e-commerce of in all sectors becomes important, right? So that's what a startup is about. In the biotech space also, uh, as I'll give you the example, uh, the mRNA vaccine, for example, right? Was a bet made by somebody many years back. It's very, they, did they know that COVID will happen? They didn't right? And it happened and they were ready, right? So it's about looking at future opportunities. So invariably in startups, uh, you will find that there is a period where you are growing, either you're very slow in growth or zero growth. And at some point, suddenly it grows, right? The key thing here is that you're betting on when that inflection point will happen. There will be many, many startups who might start too early and the inflection point may never come by the time they close down. There'll be some others who have done the timing also right and the inflection point will take off. And of course, some of them will enable that inflection point to happen just because of their work uh, that they do. So there's a difference in the curves of how startups grow. So your typical mom and pop shops, small businesses that are running are not these. Okay, so be very clear that startups are a different ball game. Okay, we are not talking about building micro small enterprises here. We are talking about startups which are looking at future opportunities, right? So examples of biotech uh, startups, right? And we'll also talk a little bit about what uh, it represents. So in startups, these are some few key elements always in all these startups. One is there's always a solution 
for a problem. There's a problem and there's a solution that's being provided. So you'll notice that there's always a problem solution um, orientation uh, to all these uh, businesses. Somebody wants food delivered at home, don't want to go and get it. Uh, there's somebody who's providing a solution and somebody's willing to pay for it, right? Uh, then there's future, as I told you, foresight. There is innovation. There's a revenue model because they're getting a service, you're willing to pay for it and rapid scaling, right? In science-based startups, like for example, biotech startups, this solution leverages specialized know-how. For example, CRISPR, right? A technique called CRISPR, which is going to change say agriculture and healthcare. And you know it because you have been studying it, watching it carefully as a new technique that is evolving in gene editing, base editing, and prime editing, right? Foresight. Hmm? Uh, the foresight leverages scientific insights. So uh, you are able to understand, for example, that, oh, recent paper says that the cause of a disease, say, for example, multiple sclerosis, uh, could be a certain virus, which basically means that I should be having diagnostics ready or a screening tool ready for those viruses, right? And that becomes your option. Uh, that's a foresight that you have that that is needed to make it happen. By the way, this is a recent news, real news. I'm not cooking it up. Uh, so there is indications now. You might bet on it. You might not bet on it, but it's up to you, right? And the innovation that we're talking about very often has to do with technical novelty or invention. <laughs> it could also do with <clears throat> business process innovation, but usually technical novelty is at the heart of it. So an mRNA vaccine, it is about how to get a mRNA there, which doesn't cause a um, unfavorable tissue response, at the same time, deliver it at the right place and ensure that it works. Right, that is the invention that has been made uh, over there, and there's a because of the fact that it involves quite a lot of time and resources. The way of resourcing it and de-risking it is very different uh, than in conventional cases. <coughs> I must reinforce the fact that technology foresight is extremely important, and this can happen uh, well in advance. Okay, and people pioneer this in different ways. These pictures you're seeing are the earliest days of wearables in MIT in the early 90s, okay? Today, you're hearing about it as wearables, right? And diagnostics with wearables, Fitbits, and so on and so forth. This was how it looked in the 90s, people walking around campus with heavy gear, uh, trying to record things, do many, many, many things, okay? Or for, them, for that matter, Elon Musk and SpaceX, right? I... I mean, I, you know, even today I find it hard to believe how a private company is financing it, right? But it's happening and you can see it happen, right? And this is amazing uh, to see and this reflects the kind of foresight uh, and the commitment to that idea that Elon Musk brings um, and convinces people also that that's the future. Um, this is, by the way, Professor Langer, and Professor Langer is one of the co-founders of Moderna. He recently spoke at Venture Center, and uh, we uh, had this event. By the way, the video is available online on YouTube if you want. Some of you can go and listen to it, because he is also uh, the founder of more than 30 companies, okay, co-founders. One of them is Moderna, right? He's, uh, he's a control delivery expert, amongst other things, and he is responsible for the lipid layer that comes around the mRNA vaccine uh, in uh, Moderna's uh, mRNA uh, vaccine. So examples such as this, people who have seen the future. But in interestingly, this is also becoming a norm today for how science is done and results of science are delivered. In the olden days, there were times when big companies would line up uh, to research uh, and uh, academic organizations to leverage the science, right? That has changed a lot. And you will find that today's Nobel laureates are also all founders of companies. Uh, if you want to do science and see it delivered in the form of results, uh, you have to take the plunge sometimes. You have to move the, uh, move the whole 
uh, in uh, effort ahead as much as possible. So, for example, Frances Arnold, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in 2018 for directed evolution and designing enzymes, uh, has several startups. Okay, uh, Caltech professor Jennifer Doudna, uh, who is from UC Berkeley, Nobel Prize in 2020 for CRISPR, one of the key people for CRISPR, uh, has several startups again. And you might have seen in the news recent developments of treatments coming up for sickle cell anemia and so on and so forth from uh, uh, such methodologies, right? Uh, and of course, uh, this is another, besides Moderna, there was one big other company, right? BioNTech and Pfizer. And these are the two founders of Pfizer. I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. I talked about Bob Langer, uh, who of course is just simply outstanding in what he does. But Venture Center was opened by somebody called Professor Friend, Richard Friend, who's a physicist, uh, who also, by the way, uh, has three companies and is one of the key persons inventing organic light emitting diodes. So why are they doing it? They're doing it because they want to see their science put to use to benefit people. And if nobody is going to come, they decide that they have to do it themselves. So they assemble the team, they assemble some of the money required and let it roll. So you find good people to drive that process ahead while you're coming up with ideas. Uh, you're not necessarily the person running the show, but you're at least your ideas have initiated something of value. And of course, uh, Many of you, you are aware of both speakers, another outstanding case of uh, scientists who developed a world-class business with an Indian name, which we are all uh, very proud of uh, as well. This, by the way, is another example. This is, uh, uh, how many of you have seen this on TV or on, uh, on your pharma shelves? Any, um, how many of you are aware of this product, Covicell? Let's hear it on the chat box. I've seen Akshay Kumar. Yes. So this is a startup out of Pune and MyLab. MyLab is a startup out of Venture Center. Um, we uh, help uh, support some of the early multiplexing uh, products that they were doing. Here again, these guys are dedicated to building diagnostics and they were working on other kits. Okay, uh, and because of that, they understood all the nitty gritties of supply chain, the best quality of raw materials, the process of automating it, uh, scaling it up very quickly and so on and so forth. Today, you see this product out there in all the pharmacies around the country, in many, many cities, right? And this is a startup right out of India. And it was stunning to see that the first company which got approval regulatory approval in India for a COVID test uh, was a startup and not a big company. And they beat even companies like Abbott to it, right? Mm -hmm. Which is fantastic to see. And the fact that, uh, you know, probably uh, it's it bodes well for uh, uh, Indian entrepreneurship. So innovation, uh, all of these involve innovation of some kind. And, um, um, and, you know, there are two main categories of innovation. And this is a formal de definition of innovation by an economist called Shampita, which says it's a market introduction of a technical or organizational novelty, not just its invention. That means just inventing is not enough. It has to hit the market. It has to see usage. And it's either a technical or an organizational novelty. Example of a technical novelty is, a, for example, the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, mRNA vaccine. And Uber is an example of organization organizational novelty, right? And why are we doing all this? As I, I gave you one reason why scientists are doing it, they want to see the science in use. But another reason why all of us have to work on this is because of this virtuous circle, you know, this virtuous circle between innovation and business. All work which relates to new idea creation, new knowledge, new uh, inventions, all of it is funded either through taxes or through investments, right? And where does that come from? That comes from profits. Even your taxes come from profits. If there were no profits, if there were no wealth creators in society, you can be sure that you would not be innovating. Okay, there's absolutely, uh, you know, very low uh, chances that you'll innovate. And even if you innovate, you will just limit yourself to very, very small uh, activities because you would not have the resources to invest in innovation. So it's very important that as a society and as a country, we close this loop. So people who 
are going to generate ideas should also look at ways to convert them into products and services and companies which generate wealth in society and the profits recycle back in the form of various different forms. Uh, by the way, when I say uh, investments, um, besides the fact that the government funds some of the work, there's also companies funding their own research work, right, in producing new technologies and so on. The charities who also get money uh, through the profits of other people uh, to fund other work, like, for example, the Gates Foundation, right? So this circle is extremely crucial to sustain innovation. And you as young people have an opportunity to contribute to this with your science, with your ideas. And as scientists, you have this great opportunity to, to be able to foresee the future because you are studying what is current, what is recent, and hopefully you're reading also about it. And you're not just limiting yourself to your class notes of your teacher from 20 years back, right? <laughs> if you're reading about it, you're keeping yourself abreast, hopefully you will come up, you'll have the foresight, you'll have the know-how to build some of these things over a period of time. So another lesson for you is if you truly want to be innovators, please don't limit yourself to your classroom. Okay, it is not easy to do anything new if you're limiting yourself to just your class notes. So how to get started as young people, right? A typical uh, startup, at least these uh, science-based startups has these three important parts. One is you need technology. And that technology, um, some you may be able to build yourself. So the reason you have so many undergrad students build apps and e-commerce companies and so on is because the technology is within the reach right? You don't have those many people say building a vaccine company, right? Or young undergraduates. Uh, but then you can tie up with people. So I'll give you examples of that. You can tie up with people who have technology access. You need a committed entrepreneur. And if you were ask me to identify one out of these three boxes, which is the most important, it is the committed entrepreneur. The, the single biggest determinant of success is the entrepreneur who is committed to the end point not the person who just enjoys the activity of discovery and invention, the person who's committed to the end point, who wants to see the product reach people, see it in use and do, do anything that is necessary to make it happen, including raising resources, funding, all of that, putting a team together and all of that. That's the entrepreneur, right? And not necessarily the person who is doing jazzy science. That's that's important, but it is not the heart. The most important is the entrepreneur who is committed to the future, right? And who's willing to take uh, the tough journey and the lonely journey that an entrepreneurship involves and funding, right? Now in funding, in all of these, uh, there were times in India before when funding used to be a challenge uh, and only rich people could do some of these uh, experiments. Today, because of various government funding, and I'm sure Shilpi must have told you some of these in the last talk, you have a lot of opportunities available and I'll briefly touch upon it as well. Technology as well, there are ways by which you can access technology and you should know how to access those technologies. Now, the key thing is whether you have an idea and whether you have a, you're a committed entrepreneur who's committed to that idea and will see it happen, right? And that's how companies uh, are typically born. So here are a few key messages. If you want to do new things, uh, you have to first learn to be dissatisfied. A person who is very satisfied in life is not likely to, to want to change things, right? Would want to see things done differently. When you walk around in the roads and you, are, you see that something is not to your satisfaction, that is the seed of, a, of, of trying to change it, okay? So dissatisfaction is extremely important when it comes to doing inventions and building businesses. The second important lesson here is that it's very important to focus on problem definition and identification, right? Ask good questions. And this is the weakness of many Indian students, right? All our life, what we do is we are given problem sets and we answer it, right? We don't ask questions. We don't pose questions, okay? So as Professor Langer says, when you're a student, you're judged by how well you answer questions. Somebody else asks the questions. If you give good answers, you get a good grade. But in life, you're judged by how good your questions are. You want students and postdocs to transition from giving good answers to asking good questions. Okay. And this is, trust me, very important in most startups that we see. 60% uh, of the work gets done the moment they have defined the problem thoroughly. Okay. And very well. 
um, otherwise they're chasing the wrong uh, uh, problem. And this is very common in uh, very often seen. Another general thing to remember is that it's important to have a beginner's mind. Uh, this is one of the reasons why young people sometimes succeed in ideas where other people, you know, who are so-called experts fail. The reason is that, you know, for a beginner, there are many possibilities and they don't mind making a fool of themselves and they don't have too much information cluttering their decision-making possibilities. They might ask, why not, right? Uh, on the other hand, the experts will give you 20 reasons why it cannot be done because they've read about it here or they've had some experience doing some experiment somewhere else. Well, it's worth listening to that, evaluating it, but don't uh, limit yourself uh, to that. It's important to have a beginner's mind. It's important to try out new things, explore them and build them out if you want to build uh, businesses. The whole act of technology, build, creating technology to solve problems is an act of connecting the dots. And the art of connecting the dots is very important to learn as well. So you'll see <laughs> that any technology is about taking a problem and solving it, right? And when you inject novelty into it, it becomes an invention. It's as simple as that. So there are problems, find solutions and do that. As a scientist, you might go and study the cause of a problem. Why is say, for example, COVID cost? You figure out this is a reason for it. Then somebody else has to work on solutions, right? Or may have been working on the solution somewhere else. Um, maybe last, so for example, the mRNA vaccine as a solution was being worked on independently for some other purpose. They didn't know COVID existed at that time, right? They connected the two. Somebody connected the two and came up with an idea which works, right? So this act of connecting the dots is extremely important and very often not taught in colleges and it's for you uh, to learn uh, along the way as well. So in these, in these pictures, three pictures that you see there, there are th all the dots are the same in all the pictures. Somebody decided to connect it in one way. Another was creative in connecting uh, that and saw a cat over there, right? That is what you sometimes need to also bring to the table, which is creativity. So don't undermine your creative activities. They are also very important. If some of you are artists, okay, uh, you're doing useful work. If some of you are musicians, you're doing useful work, okay? Don't, don't ignore that. Those could be the source of your creative uh, ideas. So for example, I had a friend once who used to be an artist who could do wonderful paintings. He connected that to the idea that uh, this uh, thought that how does the eye look at a 2D image and convert it to a 3D image in its brain, right? And he happened to be a computer science guy. So he took that on as a problem and built a career around it, right? Which is combining his art skills and looking at how the brain looks, uh, gets a view, a 3D view from a 2D image that it constructs from by just imaging what's in front of it, right? So it's, it's important to cultivate creativity in whichever way you can. You don't know where it's going to help you connect the dots, okay? Um, and one other thing I want to alert you to is many of you in academic and other organizations will find that most people uh, do their research on either studying the problem or building some toolkits. Very few of them would connect them and create a technology idea. Few of them will take it to proof of concept and then stop. Right. So in most academic research organizations, people work in this domain, they find the creative juices flowing, they enjoy this activity uh, and they stop here and they wait for people to come and help. Right. Uh, they think that, oh, you know, if there was somebody who took insulin to market in Canada, maybe they will come in India also and do it. Right. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Industry, on the other hand, is at the other end. They want to be as close to commercial production as, you, as possible. They make the most returns for their shareholders when they are taking, when, I mean, they will optimize to take risks according to the rewards that they're expecting, right? So very often in India, you'll find that many of them come at the later end. So there's a gap in interests, motivations, expectations, and trust. And that basically means that it frustrates many scientists to, uh, uh, you know, they think that their job stops here. Right. And they never see any of their ideas end up in use. Uh, 
So if you want to see your ideas put to use, you need to find ways to bridge a gap. And one good way to do that is a startup. Okay. And that's why you should consider uh, startups as an option to convert science and technology into products in, uh, in use um, as well. Right. Okay. Here is a quick short lesson from the mRNA vaccine story. So uh, all of you are familiar of the two main platforms, one from Moderna and one from BioNTech Pfizer, right? Which is which has been in the market uh, in the US, Europe, and so on. In India, we have not allowed it yet, but nonetheless, uh, this is a very significant achievement. Uh, there was an article in Nature in about October or so, uh, which some of you would love, I might want to read since you're all bioscience, life science students. It talks about the history of the mRNA vaccine. Uh, you see this chart out here. I just want to quickly just tell you about it a little bit. You will see that uh, mRNA was discovered around 1961 and uh, the progress has been slow in the very beginning. Simultaneously, these lipid-based delivery systems which encapsulate the mRNA, vac uh, the mRNA in a vaccine was also in the works. And uh, people started exploring liposomes for mRNA even way back in the 70s, right? But there was a problem. The problem was that mRNA was getting, uh, was not able to evade immune detection, okay? And that big discovery happened in around 2005. And this, by the way, is probably a Nobel Prize winning work, which might end up with a Nobel Prize one day. But this particular thing in 2005 changed the game. While that was happening, there were people who knew that mRNAs could be used for many things like cancer vaccines and so on. So one of the earliest uh, companies called CureVac was founded around 2000. And you can see that uh, based on this development and a scalable method for manufacturing lipid nanoparticles, two teams connected the dots, one in Germany, which is BioNTech, and one in the US, Moderna, which basically said that there's an opportunity out here which we should uh, push. So since 2010 or 2008, they're all working on it, right? Um, and they've gone through very tough times. They didn't know that this is going, this is a uh, possible use uh, for it. And then in 2020, COVID struck, right? Uh, and they were both in a position to do it. Of course, CureVac was relatively slow, but these two have been able to move it very quickly uh, uh, to the market. Thanks, of course, to uh, considerable amount of investments in BioNTech's case from Pfizer and in Moderna's case from their own uh, investors who took considerable risk. So lessons here. First of all, one should understand that if you were only doing mRNA uh, and you didn't look around, look at what's happening in the lipid world, you would have never been able to do it, right? The people who created Moderna, the co-founders, connected the dots, right? They knew that the lipid uh, delivery system, Professor Langer was the expert, uh, mRNA developments were happening, and these, this was the time to connect it. And they could quickly get a vaccine out uh, much faster than what was ever done uh, before. So you must look at co-developments in other fields if you want to innovate. If you want to be an entrepreneur or innovator, you must look around you. You must follow other domains and what is happening. So one of the things I ask many young people is, do you read any other journals? Do you read any magazines? Do you read Scientific American? Do you read Nature? So on and so forth. It's all available online. Or are you happy with Stardust, right? <laughs> and Cricket World. And if that is the case, um, you know, by the way, nothing wrong with those. Please do that also. But please spend some time reading about other technologies as well. If you want to be seriously developing new technologies and businesses in the biotech uh, space, right? So innovation thrives in tangled co-developments in other fields. It doesn't survive in isolation very often, okay? So please keep that in mind as well. So here are the two people who invented it. By the way, this was a team in UPenn at that time. Uh, they almost gave up. They had these nucleoside modified RNAs. They licensed somebody who <coughs> uh, didn't, uh, uh, you know, who actually later made much of the returns, not UPenn. But they are the people who made that significant breakthrough of nucleoside modified RNA, which is likely to hopefully win the Nobel Prize uh, uh, one day. But I must tell you that Dr. Carrico actually works for BioNTech today. The real entrepreneurs who build the business, okay, were different, right? So, and they went through tough times. So for example, CureVac founder in, uh, uh, this was way back in 2000, 
right? Uh, when he spoke in a conference, a Nobel laureate stood up and said that this is completely shit. What you're telling us is completely shit. That's what the Nobel laureate said. Okay. So as I told you, you must have a beginner's eye. You should, experts can be wrong. Okay. Uh, you need to keep your mind open and look at what is uh, uh, possible. And these are the real champions, right? The two people who founded BioNTech. They are the people who kept the focus on the final result. They took it all the way. So these are two people who raised the money for it. They they understood the opportunity. They were willing to wait to get the results and make sure that it happens. And that's how uh, both of them got started and uh, built the company out, right? Okay, so it's a few quick tips and pointers. In many businesses, you uh, if you're building a business, you need to decide which product you're going to make. And you often need to decide what your product represents, right? Is it a candy? Is it a vitamin? Or is it a painkiller? Let's understand the difference, right? Uh, candy is something which you are, cannot resist, right? Um, uh, you know, all of you have your own candies in different ways which you want to get, right? Maybe a Netflix account or something like that. Hmm? Um, or Facebook, for example. It's, it's, you, it, you're drawn in uh, uh, to consume that. Uh, vitamins are those which are not essential for you, right? They're desirable. So you can wait for three months. Um, nothing will happen, right? And you might postpone the buying decision. Painkillers are those where you will never, never postpone your decision. You will, if you're having a headache, you'll go and buy a headache medicine immediately and have it, right? So clearly you can understand here uh, that, you know, it's always easier to sell a painkiller, right? Because people are dying, so to say, to buy it, <laughs> right? Uh, and, uh, and, they, and of course, candy also is relatively easier to sell, but provided you have convinced them and it's interesting enough for them, right? On the other hand, vitamins are harder to sell, right? So anything that say you're doing, say for the environment, right? Uh, and you say, tell people that it's good for the environment, so do it. Uh, whereas there's no pressure on them to do it, they might postpone the buying decision. So running a business which is focused on such things is much harder compared to uh, unless it's made a compulsion. So for example, if you were using plastic and you brought in a, a better uh, the degradable plastic, which is used for bags, uh, unless there's government rules forcing it, people may not be willing to pay double the cost to buy it. Okay. So you should be clear what you're building and obviously try to make it as much as possible a painkiller uh, rather than a, a vitamin. The other thing to remember is that innovation is a team sport, right? It's a, it's a marathon and not a sprint. So here you can see Usain Bolt out here. Uh, and on the right, you can see uh, Eluid Kipchoge, uh, the guy in the white bunion, right? And there were 43 world-class athletes who ran with him so that he could finish the marathon in two hours, okay? Which is a remarkable pace for a marathon. Okay, absolutely, you know, unbelievable pace uh, for a marathon. Why were they running with him? Because they were breaking the wind for him so that he could move faster. He didn't have the resistance uh, of wind uh, blowing against him and therefore they could do it, right? Today, you, the, the, the person you know is Kipchoge out there. You don't know all these other guys who ran with him. They were also top class, world class uh, uh, people, right? Uh, Usain Bolt, you of course know because this is more like an individual uh, sport, right? So very often what happens in startups is that the real hero that you want to present is the guy in the white shirt there. Uh, uh, and there'll be many others who will contribute. And very often the scientist concerned or the person is one of those breaking the winds in the front, okay? It's the entrepreneur, the person who's committed to the end point, who is the person in the white dress. So many people in science have a problem accepting that, okay? They have a problem accepting a team culture. They are so much ingrained in this whole idea of how science progresses with Nobel Prizes and individual winners like Usain Bolt, uh, that they find it hard to digest this whole idea. So for example, Professor Langer's simple recipe for all his startups uh, is that he's, a, he's, a, he's a, always a minority shareholder. Okay, He always encourages his postdocs to be the front page people for uh, or uh, whoever can run, run the company in the front. 
right? They are the ones who represent Kipchoge there. And Professor Langer is one of the people uh, breaking the wind for him uh, or her uh, in the front. So it requires a little bit of a mindset change. And it's also a long race. It's not meant to be over in a fraction of a second. So if you think that it's for quick returns, you know, you should forget it. It's not likely to happen. <laughs> Another important thing in startups is the importance of intangible assets, okay? This graph here is very illustrative. You can see that from 1975 to 2018, you can see how the proportion of tangible to intangible assets in the most valued companies has changed, okay? So what you're saying, seeing is a list of companies which are top of the list in the stock market, okay? In 1975 and 2018. And what's in gray is the tangible assets and blue is the intangible assets, right? You can see that in 1975, all the companies which are listed there are nowhere on the list in 2018, right? They're all companies which are relying on intangible assets, right? Intangible assets includes know-how, includes intellectual property, includes brand, trademarks, all of those things. Okay, and many other things like goodwill, okay, relationships, and so on and so forth that companies uh, build over a period of time. So it's very important that you realize that the world has changed and that intangible assets are a very important part of building companies uh, in the future. So don't just think that, you know, the olden days of how we build businesses is going to fly again, it's going to be a lot about intangible assets. One other point I want to tell you about is about what motivates entrepreneurs. Uh, my observation is that it is not about money. Okay. It is only a byproduct. Money is a byproduct. What is most important for most entrepreneurs is that they think that this is a vehicle by which they are realizing their full potential. They don't find what they're doing challenging enough. They don't find something that they're doing impressive enough. They think they're capable of doing a lot more and a lot better, right? And they want to pursue their own ideas and they want to realize their full potential. That becomes a very important driver for most uh, entrepreneurs. So if you are under the impression that it's money, it's not necessarily that. And if it happens, great, right? But very often people jump into this because they want to realize their full potential. So now leveraging bio incubators and then I will close. So first of all, incubators are very important parts of ecosystems, innovation ecosystems, especially where a natural ecosystem doesn't exist. Okay, now suppose you are in a city which has a very rich ecosystem, everything is available in the city, maybe a Boston of the world or whatever it is, that's a different matter. But if you're not there, you need an ecosystem and incubators are the like Shishti or Venture Center are the nucleus for such ecosystems. First and foremost, in my opinion, it is a supportive home for the lonely innovator, right? Imagine if you were pushing an agenda of a particular future and everybody at home, everybody at work told you that you were a fool pursuing it, right? It's so much comforting to be in the midst of 50 other fools like you right? <laughs> it is, that's how it is. So you want to be in the company of people who are all pursuing ideas of that kind. And that's what incubators do. So the peer network is one of the biggest advantages and the gains of an incubator. Second is a facilitating and a resourceful ecosystem. You have services, facilities, resources, networks, events, all running, which fill up gaps, which close some of the holes in the incubation ecosystem. And you want to make it a nucleus for innovation and entrepreneurship in your own city. So in Venture Center, we have the stepping stone model for innovation ecosystem. So this is how we describe it, that if you were, say, planning to cross a pond, right? You need to decide which pond to cross. You need to decide which path to take. Where do you want to cross it? You need to know whether there are some stones missing on the way, uh, which will stop you from crossing right? Uh, and those stones need to be filled up, right? So an incubator guides you in that process, helps you find the path, which pond to cross, which uh, stones to fill, right? And many incubators will try to fill up those stones for you so that you can cross over uh, as, as well as possible. But you cannot have you you cannot have ecosystems which are suitable for every kind of business. So very often you also have to look around to see go to the place where the ecosystem is best for you, right? Wherever in the world it is, whoever values it the most, that's where you should go if you're building uh, global 
uh, startups. So in Venture Center, for example, I'm using this as an example to illustrate that we have tried to fill up the gaps in the ecosystem. So there can be infrastructural facilities, there could be mentoring activities, there could be pockets of funding, fellowships, grants, seed funds, CSR funding, and so on. Information like our funding database, for example, or a library that we offer, uh, or plug and play labs where you can come and do your work. And of course, there are terms and conditions against all of this. There's also prototyping uh, facilities. So you can do quite a lot of advanced prototyping uh, in the incubator. You could do some testing analysis, different lab, different incubators have different kinds of specializations and different facilities. You can use those. For example, Shishti has a very good collection of natural uh, 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 things relating to organisms and natural products, right? So you might want to use some of that. Uh, regulations, advisory on regulations, tech transfer, intellectual property, partnerships, networks, all of these add up into creating the ecosystem that you want to build and you know this you might have a good facility you might have some rooms all of that but also some advanced scientific facilities for example one of the things we focus on uh, is also med tech and med tech we even have a clean room uh, to take it all the way till clinical trial samples which not too many people around the country uh, can uh, do as well okay another important aspect of building a startup in india is the role of grants right so you can imagine, I told you that this is the graph for building a company, right? You have to take some risk and there's some rewards at the end. Now, if, uh, if you had uh, multiple options available where you could take less risk and get the rewards, you will never get into things which involve more risk, right? So the government or other charities try to fill up some of that cost to grants such that your rate of return increases and investors also get a better rate of return. That is the purpose of grants, right? They help you reduce your uncertainties. They help you improve the internal rate of returns of this activity. And therefore, by also creating, closing some of the funding gaps, they help you move ahead. So uh, Shilpi must have talked about this, but I'll, sorry. Uh... Yeah, Shilpi must have talked about this. In this, you can see uh, there's funding at different levels in India. And, uh, you know, uh, you can see different pockets is rough numbers. I don't mean, mean that this is the right numbers all the time. Uh, you can see that there is a continuum needed. If you have funding in the beginning and no funding later, that's also a problem, right? So you have to figure out a way by which you have continuum in the, in the funding uh, as you go along, right? And at different levels, you need different funding. In the olden days, you'll only have these orange ones on the top where family money was used and then some investor might come in. So for example, maybe like what Kiran Majundar Shah might have done in the beginning before say ICICI Ventures or somebody came in with investments, right? Or Pramod Chaudhary did from Praj. On the other hand, today you have lots of funds available for first generation entrepreneurs, especially in knowledge sectors like bio, there are funds available in different forms which you can tap to build that early part of the company so that you can go later and take other, uh, use other resources such as investors. In this, the red ones you see here are all Byrac, and you can see that Byrac has a continuum of funding across the board for biotech startups, which allows you to go from fellowships to grants to match funding to seed investments uh, and so on till the uh, till as far as possible before you raise your private investments. Okay, and this is very useful. By the way, if some of you want to get started, we have a very good funding database available to everybody called funding.venturecenter.co.in. You're welcome to go and use it uh, if you're planning to do that. Also, there are policy issues which allow people to now participate in different activities. So for example, this is an office memorandum, this by DSIR and this by DBT, which allows uh, research institutions to offer you technology. So if you're a young entrepreneur, you can approach research institutions and see if they will offer you, if they have the right technology and if they can offer you to build a startup with that. And this is a pioneering active, uh, pioneering policy of the government uh, way back in 2009 and now adopted by many, many other uh, departments as well, uh, which has allowed this to happen as well.
So with that, you can also create spin outs from research institutions. So for, for example, from NCL, there are several spin outs in diagnostics, devices, energy, and so on and so forth. And this is with young people uh, who have helped create this. So I wanna close with a few glimpses of biotech startups by young students, just like you, uh, who have built some of these startups over a period of time. Some of them may be PhDs also, but uh, in the, nonetheless, soon after their studies, right? This is a company out of UDCT, uh, alumni uh, venture center supported called KB Calls, which is into microbial colors. And they're doing very well. They have their own facility now in Bosri near Pune. And uh, they're supplying now uh, in Europe. And these are all microbial colors using uh, uh, microbes to generate colors. Here is a, uh, a company founded by a young uh, student from ISER Pune uh, called Aditya Kabra. He, by the way, was, um, was also the founder of their entrepreneurship club uh, when he was a student. And this is a company which focuses on 100% um, compostable um, products for fresh foods and beverages industry. So imagine uh, cups and these kind of pouches and so on and so forth, which will be fully compostable, okay? <laughs> and by the way, I must tell you that this is with a scientist in NCL. Uh, so the technology, some part of it and now know-how comes from NCL. So it was possible to make that happen. <laughs> this is a company by this lady scientist and entrepreneur uh, uh, from the... Uh, the uh, uh, from uh, the Defense Institute of Advanced Technology in Pune. Uh, she built this thing, which uh, this device, which basically does breath analysis for best cancer detection. This is from Manipal Institute of Technology. These young bunch of people have built this uh, uh, great medical refrigerator, miniaturized one for vaccine delivery, being currently being used in many states in India for delivery of vaccine at the last mile, uh, COVID vaccines. On the right, you see somebody who came from PhD from IGIB uh, and National Institute of Immunology, uh, who basically set up this company, which is discovering drugs uh, for uh, vitiligo or um, um, leukoderma, which are the white patches you see on people's uh, skin. Here is a young uh, engineer who's uh, developed make new ways by which you can process sanitary pads uh, waste um, in, without burning them. Okay, and they have several corporates that they're serving right now in many in, in at least in three cities of uh, India. Here is a young uh, entrepreneur, lady entrepreneur, Geetanjali, who um, was from Shastra University in Tamil Nadu and then went on to build this company out. Uh, X uh, maybe spent a year or so in TCS uh, and this uh, wonderful device, which is basically um, does AI enabled imaging and uh, identification of uh, microbes in wound uh, areas. This is a company on bioactives, uh, two PhDs uh, who just finished their PhDs and, uh, and postdocs uh, working on these um, bio uh, glasses, which are used for medical applications, right? Um, this is a young engineer working on artificial limbs. Here are a bunch of two young engineers working on UTI detection with uh, diagnostics. They are one of the Carbex award winners uh, and working on several interesting ideas. Another young uh, engineer working on uh, using waste, agro waste to do high value products. Here is somebody who is who bet on electric vehicles, battery swapping for electric vehicles well before uh, others did in India. And right now, uh, he has one of the largest chains available uh, for uh, battery swapping uh, in uh, Pune and I think also in Bangalore now coming up. Uh, here is a young uh, person, again, a physicist by training, uh, who is looking at intraocular lenses, okay, along with a bunch of materials scientists who are developing a new generation of intraocular lenses used for cataract surgery, which can be modified, uh, which whose power can be modified after the surgery, okay, which is very remarkable, by the way, right? So that's it. So here are some examples of, for many of you to get started. Uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, happy to take a few questions if time permits, otherwise I'll close. So thank you for the organizers once again. So over to you uh, and I'll stop uh, here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, Dr. Premnath. That was a very power-packed, energetic uh, talk today.
i wish we your talk has uh, ignited a lot of minds and we will see the future entrepreneurs uh, students uh, if you have any thing to ask dr premnath you can ask if anybody is interested you can type a question on the chat box or yeah, raise you your hand you can also type the questions in chat box uh, hello good afternoon uh, yeah this is saurabh uh, so i had to ask that uh, what are the main key elements for a tech startup in its early stage because most of the things that uh, problems are faced is in early stage so what can you say about that yeah i spoke a little bit about that uh, let me just reiterate that the uh, at the very beginning you know it is about you conceptualizing your idea your business idea right so the problem defining the problem first hand understanding it in depth then coming up with a broad solution identifying the technology which will make that solution possible finding partners who are willing to offer you that technology and to make all this happen resources right so it's all about the first it starts always with this one committed one or two committed entrepreneurs okay they have to make up their mind to do it so if they don't jump in nothing happens right and people who are putting their feet in multiple boats they don't succeed usually okay so the first thing is that person then you're defining your problem well and following that up with finding the resources for it both technology and money right so these are the things that you first end up doing thank you sir so again that uh, what are the major challenges that they face and because of that uh, some of the startups uh, although they have creative ideas but due to that challenges they uh, don't proceed in being a bigger company so can you list how that challenges yeah so in the earliest stages um, the kind of challenges we very often see first of all as i told you you need a, a somebody who is very committed to building a business um, very often it's hard to find co-founders okay so you have to sell the idea to other people you have to sell the idea to investors all of that so the ability to tell a story and to sell an idea is a very important trait okay so many of you might want to learn that as a soft skill that means you should be able to communicate why people should be interested in what you're saying okay and why they should bet on you and bet on your idea right so that becomes one of the key challenges that we see very often in the very beginning okay by the way uh, you will be surprised that uh, there are there is money available there aren't enough investable proposals available okay and uh, 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 it is it is very often a challenge to get it that far uh, till people have investable ideas that means and it's just not you know some flaky idea you have to go and do in depth uh, understanding of what exactly the customer wants how you're going to solve it how is it different from other solutions available how do you stand out and why they should buy your product okay that getting that far is quite uh, is is difficult and if people think you know they just hear the stories of all these startups uh, making uh, uh, you know coming in the news and they think it happens very quickly it doesn't okay so for example flipkart uh, got bought uh, by walmart about after 12 years okay uh, amazon was in the red for many many years right uh, and by the way flipkart is still in the red right it is yet to make a profit okay and so it is not it's not the glitz and glamour here it is about solving the problem so we look very clearly at we want to see people who are committed to solving the problem okay if it's a vaccine you want to build a vaccine to solve that need okay it's not about getting the first award here or some competition winning some competition here that doesn't cut it okay i hope i answered your question yes sir thank you sir um i have a question um like you had mentioned um, in one of your slides um, like comparison between candies versus painkillers versus vitamins uh, can you elaborate on that i think sorry uh, can you repeat it i didn't quite understand what your question was 
uh, like in one of the slides in today's yeah. presentation, there was this comparison between uh, candy versus painkillers versus vitamins. Yeah. For like uh, companies, can you elaborate on that? I don't understand that. Okay, so uh, let's take a couple of products, right? Um, let's take a vitamin tablet, right? If your doctor tells you buy a vitamin tablet and have it, right? You are under no compulsion to buy it, right? You might take three months to buy it. So the, 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 the real pull from the customer side is not really there, right? If you have a headache and your doctor prescribes a crocin, you'll run to the shop and buy a crocin, right? Okay, nobody, you're not going to wait, right? Uh, and if you're really keen on uh, having a toffee, also you'll go and buy it, right? So it's the same thing out here, which is that if imagine that um, you, have, you are working on a business idea where you're developing a product, as I gave you an example, uh, say a plastic bag uh, for filling up grains in a supermarket, which is 100% compostable, home compostable. Okay, and it is available at twice the price of a plastic uh, uh, polyethylene bag, right? Um, majority of the people will not switch over just because you're saying it's good for the environment, right? So it's a vitamin at that point. But if the Maharashtra government comes and says that it's banned, right? The polyethylene bags are banned, then it has become a painkiller because they have no choice. They have to buy it. And they're willing to pay the two rupee two extra uh, cost that is uh, involved uh, in it, isn't it? Now, on the other hand, uh, for candy, uh, you know that uh, you know whatever you think. I don't know uh, what you think, uh, but uh, you know, would you go and if you had all the money, would you go and buy a Gucci bag? Sorry, who asked me the question? Yeah, um, I asked me. Would you buy a Gucci bag? I may be, I don't know if I have the desire to buy, uh, like buy one. Yeah. Would you buy, would you want to drive around in a Ferrari? Many people want to show off, right? That's yeah, candy. That's true. That's true. That's true. Right. <laughs> so uh, that's candy for them. Okay. So that's what, so you products which are positioned as candy and painkillers uh, are easier to sell. Vitamins are harder to sell. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Sir, I have one more question. Um, uh, like regarding the slides about the history of the mRNA vaccine, the lesson that we learned is yeah. innovation thrives in tangled co-developments in other fields. Yeah. Um, can you like explain the meaning of tangled co-developments? Yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, you must read that article if you're interested. Okay. Hmm? It's available uh, online. Just Google uh, the history of mRNA. Uh, it's on nature. It's a very well written article. It's worth reading. Okay, if you please do read as biologists, all of you should read it. The what I what what I was trying to illustrate to you was that on one side there was work happening on mRNA, right? Without necessarily thinking about how it would be encapsulated in a lipid layer, right? mRNA by itself, people were working on. On the other side, there was work happening on lipid nanoparticles, right? Uh, which uh, was being done for other drug deliveries uh, and other kind of uh, uh, applications. Somebody had to connect the two saying that, you know, mRNA is not getting, reaching the right locations for it to, for it to be active. Okay. And how do I protect it and take it to the cell where it will be utilized to make the proteins that you want to make? Right. So, and they thought that lipid nanoparticle is the right way to do it. So you need to track then the developments in nanoparticles, right? Lipid nanoparticles. So what I was trying to tell you was that multiple developments happen in different fields and you often end up picking it up and utilizing it, right? Today, for example, you might have heard about quantum technology, <coughs> right? Uh, on one side, there's advancements in computing. There's one side, there are very large data sets coming up, large AI algorithms coming up, which need a lot of computing resources. So you need new comp computing tools. On the other side, there is physics happening of quantum mechanics, right? How do you leverage quantum mechanics to make those kind of uh, chips that you need or the kind of computing devices needed to do those kind of computations? 
on the third side you know that chips have become now are reaching the limit uh, in terms of how small you can make it the how small you can make the transistors right so all these developments are happening parallelly and that's what gives you the opportunity right it is not in isolation if you were just a quantum mechanics guy studying quantum mechanics it's not necessary that you will see the opportunity in quantum tech so you need to have a wider set of uh, you know learnings and information to draw upon to make that uh, happen okay so that's what i meant by that okay thank you sir so tangled um... so i just want to confirm tangled in the sense that both of them uh, are happening it's like a snake tangling with each other two different okay. strands of work happening at some point they meet each other so it is about uh, you know different topics uh, entangle with each other at different places okay and you have to be ready for that yeah okay mm -hmm. like that would make sense thank you sir yeah okay i think we can stop here i suppose yeah thank yes, you very sir. much it is a pleasure uh, uh, talking to all of you uh, you know if you have any uh, questions uh, or anything you want to uh, understand you're welcome to uh, write to us i'm just right this is my uh, uh, email address okay and uh, all the best to all of you and we hope to see some of you reshaping the world tomorrow's biotech world Okay. Yes. Yes. Bye. Bye. Sir. Thank yeah. you.